Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Zell Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am joined by a very dear friend of mine, Neil Mapes. Neil, how are you doing? Pleased to meet you, Zed. You're Excellent welcome. stuff. If you've been watching my channel for a long period of time, you would have seen that in the very early days of my channel, from the point of recording this video, it's been roughly about three years. Yeah, the least. Look yeah. at that. He's been getting younger, I've been getting older, right? <laughs> and so about three years ago, I've done a video where I went to a friend of mine, Jules Woodland in uh, Kent in the southeast of England and I've done a chair making course what ended up being in the middle of a hurricane <laughs> in the woodland, do you remember that? Yeah. Like literally a hurricane had passed through like the day before um, and we've done a video like three years ago so that was the last time I, uh, I saw Neil and obviously we've kept in touch, it's been a very well received video and um, now what I'm here now is I'm in the county of Shropshire which is in the west of England in the West Midlands and we're right on the border with Wales and we're in a place called Telford and we're more specifically in Ironbridge, did you say? Yeah, this is Colebrookdale, which is in Ironbridge, yeah. So. Right, and this is a very historic location. Now we're in uh, the headquarters for the Small Woods Association, which is an association in the United Kingdom that are doing an incredible amount of work, teaching small wood owners about various aspects of managing woodland and all the crafts that go with it, primarily centered around green woodworking. Neil Mapes, is, uh, Neil Mapes is one of the primary teachers here, but he's also a dedicated teacher in his own right. Now, one caveat I will add, in the future I will be doing a video about the center itself, because it's got a very his, uh, a lot of history behind it, uh, and it's an absolutely stunning location. So I'm here today to spend quite a bit of time with Neil, and he's very kindly taken the time out to show the process from absolute start, literal start, to finish on how to make a shave horse, and more specifically, a Bodger's pattern shavels because there are many different models that are out there now don't worry if you're trying to figure out what that pattern is you will be seeing that as we move forward and actually in the next segment we're actually going to look at an example uh, of what we're going to aim to replicate so Neil is going to very kindly take the time out uh, to show this in this video now a couple of things I will stress in this video as you can see from the timeline it's a very long video now that's necessitated in order to show every single step of the process and there are a lot of steps involved um, it's not a, a, a a simple item to make as such and uh, there are a few subtleties and nuances along the way and along with Neil's kind of experience of many many years uh, we can hopefully partake to you some tips and techniques to start to finish on how you can make your own shave horse should you so desire so you can see obviously it's a long video that's necessary in order for all the steps in, uh, involved and for us to cover that properly the second thing I will add if you look in the description just below this video you will see a timestamp of all the different sections of the process of making a shave horse. So if you want to jump to a particular section uh, of this shave horse making process, you can jump straight to that down below in the description. So with your kind permission, Neil, yeah. uh, what we're going to do now in this next segment, we're going to look at an example of the shave horse we're going to be actually building and then get on with the actual build from there, working with a fresh piece of ash uh, that's only recently been felled. So hope you enjoy the rest of this video. Well, Neil, Neil Mapes is going to teach you how to make a Bodger's pattern shave horse using hand tools and fresh wood. So Neil, this is a rough example of the type we're going to build. Um, I know you said the one we're going to build is slightly different, but just to touch on this, you mentioned it's a specifically a Bodger's pattern. Yeah. Um, so can you explain what you mean by that? Well, the Chilton Hills is a big area where the beech trees are and, and around High Wycombe particularly, although there was other areas here, there was a chair making um, industry as well. So High here Wycombe, just for those watching who may not know, that's just outside London, isn't it? It is, so. north of London, yeah. And, uh, the, Predominantly beech trees, beautiful area, and there was a lots and lots of be um, uh, chair makers uh, who were working in that area, and were known as bodgers. And this was a synonymous, really, to that sort of working. It's quite a narrow space here, and you can imagine it's just really for chair legs that they were, were for, for draw knifing on to get them down to a, a roundish uh, billet to be able to go onto a, a um, onto a pole lathe. So you can see it's, it's um, three legs, good for uh, uneven ground, quite a stable process. This one's a bit shorter, this is really aimed at more um, for children, uh, but uh, with a bit of a longer body, we'll make it a bit, uh, bit more for your size, Z, I think. Um, so the three legs, two at the back, one at the front. The angles that I put on are normally around about 25 degrees, sloping outwards. Um, I do that pretty much on all my benches and, uh, that I make. So that's a, um, a, uh, an angle that I'm quite used to uh, drilling into legs with. 
So we'll have a body of ash, the whole thing will be made of ash, including the, uh, the wedge, um, the, the, the upper uh, ramp will be a little bit longer as well. And then we've got a frame that comes off, so we have a treadle on the bottom, which is used with two feet, so you sit across it and trapping a piece in, you'll actually use both your feet. Uh, and pushing away, trapping a piece of timber underneath. Um, so we've got the treadle, we've got a, a, an adjustable height with a uh, handle there and then there's the clamp on the top which can be adjustable as well depending on what size piece of timber. So it'll be a bit of an all singing, all dancing. Perfect. And you were mentioning that because of this uh, specific style it's easier to transport, is that correct? Yeah, because that... the legs can come out, the, uh, the top will come off, everything comes apart so it'll all be in a kit form and the legs will just sit in to quite deep socketed uh, holes or mortises. There's um, a one interesting thing with this particular style, which I've not actually seen before, is uh, the carved seat. I think that's a, that's a beautiful addition actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, which uh, is a, 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 a twist that I've put on, because at the end of the day, if you're doing a lot of pole lathe turning and you're, you're sitting on a shave horse, the worst thing you've got is something that's going to really hurt your backside. You want something that's fairly comfortable. Um, so that's really why I, I, I put this scallop seat in. There's a lot of work involved in that, but it, will, it, will, it can be done in the time per that we've Perfect. Got. So this is the style that we're going to be working to, and obviously it's going to be tweaked slightly at the final version that we're actually going to build. Yeah. Um, so what is the next step in the process? Are we going to uh, now work with a uh, fresh piece of ash and yeah. then start Yeah, so um, a tree was felled uh, two days ago. Um, ash tree, local uh, material, and um, we've got two uh, parts of the butt here the lower part and the, the next part above it. Um, uh, the tree actually came from an area known as Nedge Hill, which is uh, approximately uh, three or four mile up the hill from here. And um, that was felled and brought on site. Uh, the next section that we'll be looking at, we're gonna be uh, cleaving or splitting the main trunk apart to make the main body. That'll be the first part, and then everything else gets built off the body. Perfect, so we'll move on to that section now then. So Neil, here's the beautiful piece of ash in question. Yep, felled locally, um, uh, only two days ago. So it is really green, still after um, some summer growth in it. So uh, this is part of a site where it's come from, where it's been managed, actively managed. So there's a lot of trees that were planted about 40 years ago plus, and now they're being thinned and um, the wood comes here and we use it as part of the courses and also for firewood for uh, uh, but beautiful pieces like this <laughs> tend to get used uh, for craft work. Okay. So with this one, the um, just so for the folks that are watching, is there a particular diameter they should be looking for when? Uh, well, this is probably a little bit on the large side for a shave horse, but uh, anywhere between 10 to 12 inches, because we're going to get a seat out of this bit here. Right. Yeah, this is where you're going to be sat on this. So we might just clean the sides up. Um, just to give it a, a square of feel to it, but predominantly it'll just be half a log um, and then uh, it will get narrowed down where the, the front end of the shave horse is where the frame fits. So, but if you've got a nice large seat at the back, that gives you uh, plenty of uh, room to sit on. And so the first step in the process is using the fro, you said? Yep, so we've got a fro here and a maul. And, and if you look, just basically there's a, a very small crack in the timber there, which we're going to have to use. And I, I'm not using the, the fro to split it. All I'm doing is I want to mark where we're going to be uh, driving the wedges in. So I've got something to aim to, a nice straight edge. Okay. So you're essentially just scoring? Just scoring, it's just putting a mark in, that's all. Um, the old traditional uh, way was using axes, a lot of people use axes, and, and also froze were used as well. Um, so it's really as do different traditions. Uh, the other thing is I've got this um, mortising axe, made by Grants for Brooks, but there are other companies who are making them as well, and all I'm going to do now is just following that line, hitting the back of the, the axe with a wood, never metal against metal in this particular case, not where you've got a really good fine axe cut. Um, I would, uh, wedges are okay, metal against metal, because uh, we're going to use a sledgehammer because they've been designed to, to do that. This hasn't. 
So with this one, essentially you're taking a score a little bit deeper in. Basically. Yeah, I'm just creating a crack now. Scoring it across the timber. Okay, so now we've got a good crack in there. I'm now going to change tools. And I'm going to put the throw in the maul away. And I'm going to find one of the wedges now that we're, we've got here. And there is one that I set up that's got a a thinner and finer point to it. And, uh, so these are obviously quite heavy duty wedges aren't they? Yeah they, they are, they? they're uh, good, good quality wedges, you can see they've done a bit of work. What we'll end up doing is we're going to put two in, one about uh, a third of the way in and another one a third of the way in from the other side and it's just basically we're going to Like yeah. Now. now, what I've got to try and do is follow the the natural split of the timber. Um, it's following the grain. Basically, that's what's happening. So I'm, I've got one started there, and I want to try and get one just below that on the other side. If it will go. Yeah. I think I'm just going to open this up a bit more. So here the split is running off yeah. a little bit, so what are you doing, are you trying to bring it back I'm to? I'm just trying to bring it back in a little bit. And it, I, I think it's just the way the tree's growing and uh, one of those things, we'll just have a go. We're going to drive a wedge into there now. See how it just naturally is following the grain. Yeah. It just wants to sp split that way. So we're going to have to do what the uh, tree tells us. Work with it. You can see by driving that in, these two wedges have fallen out because we've opened the grain up. You can hear how it's cracking as we go. Yeah. No, oh, it's uh, it's not as this. Uh, a straight ground as I'd have liked. As you can see, if you look down the length of the tree, the tree is actually twisting. So it's, it's although it looks straight, as it's been growing, it's been twisting around for the light. Ah, uh, interesting. So uh, again, until you open up a tree, it's very difficult to uh, to read. So, and this is what we've got. Somebody else felled it. I didn't actually fell this, but it was felled for me. So I'm going to, it's relaxed a bit now, and I'm going to drive in a few more wedges. You can hear that cracking. Okay, we'll keep going. need to do is as you're splitting it we started off with two in the end and then we put one here to open the cut up but because we've got this movement of the tree twisting as we're growing the uh, it, it's causing us a bit of an issue but we'll get around it then what we do is we start working in pairs so we've got two together and then I've just put this third one in which is the one that was here and we um, dr we'll drive these two in and we can then remove this third one out and then that can be brought forward. So you're working that sequence yep. basically? Yeah, so it's, it's just working down the tree. Um, as you can see the probably the bottom of the cut is still connected. So we're going to have to at some point uh, really get into that and it might well be we just have to turn the, the, the tree over and, and work from the other side. You can hear the cracking. That's we've not touched that for a few four minutes, and you can still hear a little as it's driving the the, the, the fibres apart. You know, I just caught another one. Just hear it. Yep. Really, just forcing those fibres apart. Straps will need severing. So these are the fibres inside? Yeah, this is just the fibres of the grain holding together and they just split in all different directions. 
Um, not a lot we can do about that. We just have to sever the, down that end. It's okay up this end. <laughs> it's uh, it's become more fibrous. So this particular axe is referred to as a. Well, this is actually a mortising axe, which has got a long, um, thin part head to it. The the strapping axes were actually a lot longer than that, but for the smaller trees, this is probably adequate enough. And this is designed to kind of obviously split the fibres, yeah. fibres basically. And As I say, this one's designed for mortising, cutting out mortises, made by Gransfield Brooks. Um, but for this particular application, it's as, it's a good tool as well, being a long, thin axe head for getting into the. Uh, sort of splitting those straps that we've got inside just have to be a bit careful I'm going to turn me back to you now and just come this way because we've got a, a wedge here so the goal here and the straps you're referring to is the fibres basically yeah now. that's it so there's one in there which just try and yeah split that one apart and if I just take it up here I mean I know I've got some straps here today but you can see all these here we just want to Now we've split that side, we've got two wedges trapped in that end. You can see now, good from this side here, how really twisted that timber has been grown. Just one of those things. We'll, uh... So what's the tool that you're using to turn? Right, this is a, known as a PV. So basically it's, there's a hook on the one end and there's a rough portion here. And I can, rather than us rolling and <laughs> twisting my back, <laughs> I can actually just lever it quite simply over onto that side and you can now start to see where the crack all this strapping is really opening up yeah it's quite a quite a, a strange tree in that respect so, uh, right, so what I'm going to do now we've got a, a basically a wedge starting here uh, sorry a, a cut starting there but because we've got the wedges the other side I want to See if I so now you're basically severing the fibres of the Yes, that's it. This hasn't split at all. Well, quite strange. But this is uh, what you're getting with some ashes. It's the just the just the way it's grown. Can't do anything about it. See how it's split and split there. It's really not followed the grain at all. Well. So what I'm going to do is now I've just severed that one. I'll try and put another wedge in this side. So this has got an extremely bad twist, hasn't it? This? Yeah, it's uh, spiral grown, and Bodgers would have just turned this into firewood, to be honest. <laughs> but this is this is down to what you get with unmanaged timber. So you can so let me just uh, tip that on its side there we go. and you can see now how badly so as we mentioned there's a twist isn't it it's quite a nasty yeah. one uh, yeah. on this one so what we've now done um, so Neil so do you, do you want to explain so we put it onto two so we've put two, two, um, two bearers basically and what we're going to do is we're going to ping a chalk line on this edge down here okay and we're going to then put a, 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 a vertical line and we're going to axe off the worst of the timber so we've got a, a dead flat so what we'll end up doing is we'll put notches in it's a bit like the old timber framing skills we'll put a bit of a notch in and then we can knock off the bolts and then we'll use a, a broad axe to clean up the surface. So it's essentially giving us a flat edge basically. Giving us a flat edge, yeah. And so the way you've held these in place, this is quite interesting, I've not seen these before. So what are these referred to as? The, the timber dogs, they're basically, um, if you have a look, this one's got a, a flat which goes in line with the grain running in the tree here. And then on the other end, it's actually got a flat in the opposite 90 degree direction. So it's actually hitting the grain in that direction. So you, you're you not going against the fibres, you're just driving it into in line with the fibres. And, and, and that's quite solid. You look at that. That's, that's really I've never seen these before. And 
the, the old timber framed houses were were built exactly like this. They would have cleft a big oak tree mm -hmm. and um, traditionally they would have been pit sawn but originally they would have been cut out with just axe and lines <laughs> like this. And also the hammer you're using, this is a thorn oh, hammer yeah. did you say? They, these are made in Birmingham or were, I'm not, I'm not, I think the company's still going. Um, they're made by a company uh, called Thor which is uh, based in Shirley, this one was made in Birmingham. Um, so they're, and they're you quite, said it's got a leather... There's two raw hide leather faces with a cast iron head and an ash handle. I've never seen it with a leather thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they get different size. Some you get copper in the end, some you get plastic in the end. Some They're, they're all different um, applications for different crafts and jobs. But this one's got a... Great for, for actually doing timber framing because you can strike a, 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 a um, chisel um, without damaging the end. With this leather face and these are replaceable. So Interesting. Just, yeah, so they're not quite a weight. But they come in different weights as well so um, this one's well it's this size reference you can get number ones, number twos, number threes, number fours so they're basically in ounces and pounds so that's what they're re 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 referring to. But uh, the largest one I've got of these is probably about a three pound head. Wowzer. <laughs> yeah and some of the big Slicks and chisels that I've got, you just need to be able to drive it in. Do you wear your Viking helmet and uh, no. a fur cape then? <laughs> it's not no. screaming well, in that Scandinavian. Went long, that went long time ago. <laughs> so there we are. So it's just a matter of driving those into the grain, and you can see that is quite solid. And they're easily removed, you just tap them out, and, and away you go. So uh, um, a good way of locking in timber, you just have to keep, make sure that you've got them. Uh, locked in properly when you're axing. Traditionally they'd have had somebody stood on top of these logs but because this is quite thin and it's right on its edge anyway we're going to have to do it in a slightly different method. So using a chalk, chalk, chalk tape basically, a chalk, yeah, cord this chalk tape. line um, and what we're going to do is we're going to ping a line down that as a reference point um, you can see from here there's a big chunk that's got to come off in effect to create a flat bed and there's several other tools that we're going to be using to, uh, to, to, to make that so I'm just guiding myself to where that is there and you can see down the length there's quite a bit of a chunk of timber that's got to come off and we're going to cut little axe cuts into this and then strike them off. Okay so what I'm going to do there is just hold that, pull it tight, and then we're going to ping it like so. And we've created ourselves a line to Beautiful. work to. Okay. We've set it up on these bearers, haven't we? Yep. Okay, and we've got our timber dogs on. And what we're going to be using is we're going to create some V channels into this. So basically, they'll be cut out like so. There'll be another one in there. Um, like so and that's basically what we're going to be chopping out and then with an axe we'll come down and we'll take these bolts off as to, to create a, a straight surface albeit quite rough but that's what we're going to do we'll do that all the way along where we need to following that blue um, chalk line and then from it so if you look at it from a side view or top view down so here's the log resting on the, the bearers okay like so and if you have a look we're going to be cutting notches like this looking down from the top with just a so small forest axe really essentially they're acting like a stock cut so yeah. rather than having to take one massive slice off yeah you're just controlling it by taking yeah, and, and then what you can do is you can take each individual little section off at a time Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, so you get, then you've got a flat surface, um, or reasonably flat surface, then we'll go into the broad axe and then we'll start to clean it up. And that's all done on that, that situation. So then what we've got then is, if that's alright, I'll take that off. So, it's, uh, so then as we, what we've got then is we've got the, the log on its side, um, nice and flat on the bearers. And we've got our timber dogs in, yeah. And what we're going to do is then there'll be a broad axe that will come down the surface, 
uh, with a canked handle like so and we'll be chopping it down sideways to take off even more surface of the timber and uh, then we can then get a nice smooth finish. Once we've got that we can then make a mark down the middle and then start to work out the real true body size. Perfect. Okay. So you've marked a vertical line just on the edge? Yeah, so basically you either get a level or you plumb line it and uh, so that's so you've now got a nice vertical line that you're going to cut to. So, so here on top you've now carved the... A couple of notches and we go all the way down following that vertical line on the end to a point where it meet, meters out and you can see what's happening because of the wind we've got to do on the top we're cutting away here but on the bottom of this end if you come round on look at the end of this Z you'll see that this the vertical the line round, is yeah. on the other side right so we're going to have to chop out at the bottom you can see the wind down the length and we're just going to use the tree to its you know to our advantage now this is where we're going to start working it so these are the V's that you've basically chopped into yep and then these from here, notches. and then we're going to, uh, once these are all done, then you're going sideways basically. Yeah, so what you would do is um, you'd sort of uh, be careful how you stand. You don't want to be leaving your leg over that side because if you miss, bang, you could come into it. There are some guys that will, will stand over the top, uh, or you can stand like this, but if you glance off, it will come into you. So you've got to be root. So I always try and stand this side of the, t the tree. Mm hmm. And you can see I'm just going to now start knocking off the timber. And because you put that V shape in, we're now starting to shape it. I'm not going to get too particular with this axe. Because I'm going to use a broad axe a little bit later which will clean all this off. All I'm doing is I'm removing waste. So this is quite a small axe, really. It's a little forest axe. I mean, uh, the other axes I've got, I've got six and seven pounders, uh, Elwell felling axes, and these probably the ideal for that job. But this will do the job. And you can see how strappy this is. So obviously we're focusing strictly on hand tools, yeah. um, but just just to for the purposes of the video and kind of like documenting this, uh, this is somewhat obviously if you were using power tools, you would use a chainsaw as well, wouldn't you, to do these exact same stop cuts? Um, With a chainsaw, it's it's said that you can um, actually, it's ten time ten man days work is is basically grabbed back by using a chainsaw as against an axe. Right. So I remember going back years ago, I was involved with a uh, log boat and that was the uh, sort of uh, timings that they were working on. So for every one day that you work with the chainsaw, it would be 10 days with an axe. <laughs> so. so this is obviously just for demonstration purposes. Yeah. Uh, essentially doing so the we, we've done the two stop cuts there with the, with, the, with, with the axe work and we could carry on and do that all the way through. Not a problem, I'd quite happily do that. But, but for, as I say, for just for purposes sake, we can speed up the process by putting in some notches with a chainsaw and because we've got that um, line here which is giving us that vertical we're going to create that coming all the way down I'll be coming back with a broad axe later on to finish it off and clean it off Gotcha So all I'm doing is just speeding up the process So I'll just get myself kitted up This is a um, cordless chainsaw, a recent purchase and um, it's great because it's not as noisy great for environmental areas the triple SSI's that we've got around the country now we, are actually advocating the use of these. So triple SSI refers to the, the category in which it falls into, yeah? Uh, well, it's, is that, yeah, is that it's a, a site of, of scientific interest, really, right. a special site of scientific interest to give it its full title. And a lot of these areas now, because of the, the flora and fauna in them, we can't be using chainsaws um, that are, well, basically promoting, you know, poisonous uh, gases and, uh, and, and oils into the environment. So, again, there's pros and cons with this. You're not going to get a really high rated chainsaw, but they're, they're okay. Anyway, let me just get kitted up and we'll do a little bit of cutting.
probably not fully severed there. Oh, there we go. There's still some fibres to be had. So we've got two bearded axes. Um, well, one's more like the old Kentish style um, pattern, that sort of big open broad axe, but it's this slightly, uh, it is sided. Um, the only problem is with this is I, I picked this up some time ago, um, but the handle isn't canked. Can you see the difference in the handles? Yeah? Yeah. So using this one, you're going to knuckle yourself or catch your knuckles quite a lot. So I, I always try and show you that buying second-hand tools isn't all nice head. Don't get me wrong, but the handle isn't quite fitted right. Right. So, um, but it would still cut a certain amount. This axe. So if you can see, it's got a canked handle. So the handle is slightly offset. Great for if you're a right-handed side axe. So as the blade hits the timber, your handle is away from the, the actual cutting line. You see that? Interesting, I never knew that about a handle. Yeah, so always bear, bear in mind when buying a large bearded, if you've got one second hand to look at, just be aware that... Uh, Which way the handle's going. The handle's going. Um, right, so this is where you can stand over the log and we're going to be cutting, trying to cut down to that line as best as possible. Just coming up towards your camera, Z, so just be aware. Yeah. Okay, so we're just smoothing it off. This is where the other end of the log isn't quite right yet, so we still work on that. You see, we're actually cutting across the grain, which works really well. One, one thing while you're doing that, Neil, one thing I forgot to discuss, and obviously for folks that are watching, so obviously in this particular instance we're using ash, so yeah. what are the other good woods that we uh, that people could use um, to kind of like... Well, with the shavers, it's pretty much anything you can get hold of, to be right. honest. I mean, I, I've made uh, shea horses in oak, in ash, in sycamore. Ash is a bit more, uh, uh, got, got a bit more residual strength in it. Sycamore can be quite weak. Birch, I'd steer clear of, is too soft. Um, but the heads really want to be, be using the dumb heads, which we're not talking about. But if you use the ash, it's got a lot of residual strength. You know, they used to use the Morris Miners, the Travellers on the back. Well, those were all ash framed very very strong some of the other car makers that use ash i think morgan their frames were uh, made from ash so i ideally you want to use a hardwood basically yes uh, hardwood, a good hardwood oak is really heavy but um yeah, sweet chestnut you can use but that's quite soft but it still make good shave horses at the end of the day it's a tool that you're using and you just have to regularly maintain them what happens in the out out in the woods it's the legs that get really badly rotted <laughs> So you've got to be aware, under a shelter you're okay, but mm. out in the woods it's the, it's the um, moisture coming up into the grain which is going to rot off. So the beauty is, is if you don't fix the legs but have a deep deep seat like this and the legs will just sit in it with it with the mortise and a... And, a, uh, uh, and basically those you can replace really. Yeah, and then you can just replace those as and when you need to. So we're just looking at the length, so th this is five and a half feet, this one? Yeah, just over, yeah, just over five and a half. So this one we've marked off, haven't we? So you've done from that end to... To about end. there. And that's five. And then we can be using this for other parts of the, um, uh, you know, we can cleave that up. But I, because it's a wider bit down there, we can keep that for the seat, and then we can clean this up, and this will be the body. But what will happen now is we, when we finish cleaving this off, I will then take the dogs off and we will then get a, uh, a mark up a central line mm -hmm. down it and we'll then uh, measure about seven inches across so it'll be three and a half inches either side of that central line 
and then we'll cut that out as well. Right. Now ideally I'd have liked to have split that or cl cleft it off but because of the, the wind in it <laughs> I'm not too sure we're going to get anything out of it but we'll give it a go. Even if I um, make a cut in the, the right point we'll do it that way. So largely this is pretty pretty level isn't it? This at the moment. Yeah, there, there's some lumps and bumps here, there and everywhere, but uh, it's pretty much straight for the purposes that I want for this particular time. We're going to be doing some other cleaning up with other tools yet, so I'm not going to get too worked up with the, with the levelness of it, but it's pretty much there. Right, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you to um, basically with the PV lock it and then hold it in place as I take these off. Perfect. So what you're going to do is just hold that up mm -hmm. and I'm going to remove these out like that. One. Two. And you're going to lower that back down gently. Try not to get yourself hit in the process. Brilliant. Wonderful. That's it. And just uh, so what we're going to be doing now, now we've got it lying down, we're going to be chalk uh, lining a central point all the way down the, the timber. And bear in mind we're going to be cutting this down to five foot, so the end piece will get used for uh, parts on the, the rest of the frame. Um, so we're now going to just make sure we've got this centralised, and I'm just saying it's around about 11 inches, so that'll be five and a half. And an important thing when you measure it at this point is to discount the bark, isn't it? Discount the bark, yeah, completely and utterly. It's the actual timber. Bearing in mind, we are going to cut a little bit of this off to put a chamfer on the, uh, the side wall on it anyway. So it's not going to be that width. And the same applies down here. We know that's a five foot roughly there. And uh, we said that's ten and three quarters. And make that five and three, uh, three eighths. So that's the central line there. Now what we're going to do is with the chalk line. So if you can, um, uh, Kieran, if you'd like to just come and give us a hand with this, I'll just ask you to hold that on at that point there. And then what we're going to do is put that into the middle there, pull that tight. Okay, so we're in, over the, the, the pencil line. And I'm just going to now ping that, and that's giving us a central line all the way down. So this is all marked up now, Neil? Yep. And um, now what we're going to do is from that central line, we know we're going to have a seated area up around this area, and I'll probably come back down about 18 inches or so. That's just going to be a rough measurement. So that'll be your seated area, which we're going to... Uh, create a uh, saddle effect mm -hmm. um, and then from there on in what I'm going to be doing is taking three and a half inches as a, a central point we're going to mark up seven and out on the outer edge there okay you see the two marks so you've come in how much on each? so that's that's well, I've taken going off the central line the blue line yeah I've, um, where the three and a half inch mark is, I'm going to go three and a half inches that way and three and a half inches that way. So it'll be seven and, and obviously at naught there. So we've got, we're now going to have a body of seven inches in width, which is quite a wide one. We could bring it down to six. So that'd be three either side, um, which is quite, you know, but you're not going to get much of a piece of wood in there. So we're going to go for seven. Okay. A bit of a compromise. You could go even wider, but then you're going to have a really heavy body. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to be, we've got, we've got to play, <laughs> play around with the design. And I'm going to do the same down this end here. So we've got three and a half, so we know that's roughly where the outer edge is, and seven there. So we've now got two lots of lines. Now what I'm going to do is ping those lines again. Okay, and I'm going to ping now. There we go. So now you can see we've got a nice straight line down either side. So as a recap, the central line obviously gives you the central point to work out from. Yeah. Um, then the outer two lines are where 
obviously we have the seating area here yeah on this bottom section and then but here it's going to be brought into so basically what we're going to be doing from this here we're going to be cutting this in yeah like so and then we're going to create this saddled effect on here and then this is going to be thin down to that and then, line and then i'll be down to that line and we'll cut that end off there okay and that will be used for the other part of the tr um the, the frame so we've cut the end bit off yep and uh, what i'm going to be doing now is although this has got to have some further work on the top we have got to make a, a right angle cut to create a side part to the uh, to it and I'm just going to put a mark like so and then a, another mark gently there and what I'm just going to check is how parallel that is that's seven and that's just over seven and I suspect one of these is just slightly out Just slightly out, but it gives us a little bit to work at. So now that we've obviously taken the size of this off, uh, we're starting to look at the actual shape now of the um, of the shave horse. Um, so what you've done, you've actually elevated the height, haven't you? First yeah, and foremost, yeah. So taking off the low bearers, which are great for the side axe, uh, big side um, axe that we were using, um, or broad axe to clean the sides off. Um, there'll be a lot more work to do on the tops of these yet so we've just got it to a rough level um, I've got other tools that we're going to be using on this so we've raised it up to a height and we've got these timber dogs back in on these high benches and that's quite stable okay um, the next thing we're going to work on is the the actual saddle of the the, the, the shave horse and if you sort of refer back to your old one behind you you can see the sa sort of saddle that we're going to be making so it's quite a comfortable addition to it. You can at a later date add a little back to it as well and uh, there's all sorts of things going on. And, and just to recap you you yeah so you've done the the uh, the, the depth of the, the seat up to this line here. Yeah and then at the back here we can have a, a flat platform we could attach a vice if so needed you could use this for for drilling on all sorts of things. So it's a bit multi-purpose. It's basically. a bit multi-purpose. It's your, your black and decker of the uh, back in the day, isn't it? So that's what <laughs> it, <laughs> that's what it is really in effect. And now what we're going to do is we're going to um, dig out using a, an ads the shape of the uh, of the seat or the the saddle, and basically we're going to scoop it down. So when you're sat on it, your legs come down the side of either side of it. And referring back to the old one, it just gives you that nice comfortable shape to sit in. So if you're sitting in these all day, it becomes quite a, uh, if you've just got a flat seat, it isn't a very pleasant way of uh, working. Mm -hmm. um, on my shave horses, I tend to put a, a, a sheepskin or something on it anyway, just to uh, give it a bit of added comfort. Um, again, on adapted uh, shave horses, I've seen like the uh, chairs for the uh, Windsor chair saddles. You know, they, I've seen yes. those fitted on, so you you can actually have quite a thin plank and with a seat sit, sat onto it. But this is a slightly different type because we're just making it out of a straight log. So um, we have to work with that. So digging out the, uh, the, the shape of the seat. So bear in mind we've got to be going downhill with it and we'll be working in slightly different directions. So what I'm going to be doing is just chopping out starting we could have done this with a slightly bigger it's just this is what I've got here with me today small hand ads um, I have got some bigger bowl style, style ads this we're not going to be going too deep with it and once I've got a, a bit of a I'm going to come around that side of view um, but if you want me to work on this side Z and then you can see what's happening I can come across grain so you're bouncing around a little bit, so just be careful here. So you're just starting it off, little cuts like you are with a bowl, and then you can work across grain quite happily. So a question for you, if someone watching this doesn't have an ads, is there another tool that could be used that's um, a bit more Well, you could work it out with, a, uh, I suppose, an axe and 
um, then if you've got, <laughs> dare I say, even spoon knives, you could probably shape it out. Um, Ooh, if, you've got a, if you've got a saw, you could cut out so much and knock off the shape and then work it with, a, with an axe. You, there is ways and means of doing that. What would a gouge work? Like? A gouge would work equally as well. A big, if you've got a big gouge and a, and a, a, a slight hammer with that, that would work equally as well. I mean, I've just got an ads. It's just really a, 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 a gouge with a handle, uh, the largest handle on it, isn't it? In effect, see how I'm just going across the grain? And I'm working up to that midpoint line. Now I'm just going to work back. Now we're going to get quite deep here at this point along here and then it's going to come up quite um, to a shallow point so that we'll be sitting in in like a saddle in effect. So you're thinking about ergonomics essentially? Yeah, it's, we don't want any edge, edges catching our legs. So although we've got this edge here this will be quite rounded um, so it doesn't catch the underneath of our leg. Just rough marking. I, don't know. I work by sight a lot of my stuff. So you're just looking at the ergonomics of the back of the seat now, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. So you, you, it'll be a bit of a depression there. You, you, both your butt cheeks will sit in there and there'll be a slight raise as a crest in here. But it's just going to be enough for you to get a nice seat um, and not feeling too... So, so saying this in a, in a very professional... Uh, manner. Um, would it be a difference with the women and men uh, when it comes to the shaping of the seat? Or would you say ergonomically it's... Uh... Well, each seat should be made to the individual person. That's mm -hmm. the key thing. And yes, each as many different people as there are in the world, mm -hmm. each seat will be different. So if you're making your own, you really want to be sitting on it and just say, oh, it doesn't feel quite right. Let's take a bit more out of that. So it's just, you know... You'll get a basic shape where most people will fit in, but some people will want it slightly different to others. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, ju I would just urge anybody who's going to make one is to sit on it and just sit on it for a short while. Get the main roughing out done. Sit on it, and think, yeah, that's got to come out a bit more. You may find this edge or this edge is too, is not rounded enough. So you'll need to take more out of that. So. Yeah, I'm really just taking that edge right over. And then we're just going to round that edge right off. And all this all this edge here will be get taken off anyway. With the, with the other tools. Um, here is going to be a bit more of a depression coming out, so there's quite a bit more to come out of this bit yet. Yeah? In terms of what I think this would take, bear in mind we've had a bit of a problem with the uh, splitting or cleaving of this timber anyway, because of the uh, the wind on it. I would have thought somewhere in about two days you could have most of this made. Mm -hmm. So there's a, but you don't necessarily need to put a saddle on it. You could have a really nice, uh, just a, a piece of a tool that's just got a flat bottom to it. Hasn't got to have a a saddle like this. So Neil, we've obviously got a lot of it roughed out with the ads. Um, so what are these uh, tools over here? These are well, these are all in shaves or scorps, as um, some people might call them. Um, we've got. Um, various ages of uh, scorp from these older versions which are probably Cooper's tools I would have thought and you see the different curves and in shaves shapes to them these are more modern made ones we've got a flatter um, surface here which is quite good for chair making and I believe that's a German made uh, version uh, this one's made by Ray Isles a friend of mine he uh, makes and manufactures this. So basically they are just curved draw knives. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, uh, like you would with a flat draw knife, you draw them towards you. Um, so if I sort of remove the ones that are, I'm going to use the more modern ones. These tight curves are very good for getting in the, the edges in here, you see. And we may just use that to finish off the seat, but for predominant 
Lee, I'm going to be using these two over here to remove the timber. I'm going to pop these over here for now. And uh, let's start with the flatter version one, which is this. Uh, Basically, so you'll stand and you'll pull the, the tool towards you. What you're aiming for is a nice thin shaving. We're just going to take the high spots off and we're just trying to make it smooth all the way through. So essentially it really is just like a draw knife, isn't it? Basically? Yeah, that's it. It's just a, a curved draw knife. Very nice green timber, it's, it's quite easy to work. Now you can see why the deeper curves are obviously useful. That nice flat blade, there is a slight curve on that but I can't quite get in to that curve in there. And over here it will be quite, quite difficult. So we'll take off the uh, higher flat spots on the... Uh... Now we've also got to be mindful of the way the grain's running. Because as we're going downhill and across the grain, see if I cut back that way, we're cutting up into the grain, so it's just going to flare up. And it was a, a bit like spoon carving, you just got to be aware of which way the, the knife is running with the grain. So we're working it down. This is just a tool to get it flattened down. We're, we're going to be using other tools like a travisher to uh, start that off, finish it off, I should say. Um, Yes, we could get into uh, chair making te territory and get it really finely finished and that's up to you, but it's a working tool this at the end of the day. So this is a more tightly curved? Yep, this is a tighter curved uh, end shave and I'm just... So when you're buying these, how do you know the, the curvature? What kind of reference points are you looking for? So let's say I go to a website and it's... Well, it's uh, individual makers are making them as they see fit. I mean, obviously the German-made version over there. Um, I'm just I can't, off the top of my head to actually think who makes that one, but I will find out. Uh, this one is, as I see, Ray Isles, and this is his style of chair making. I expect he's been to several makers and they've come up with this version, which is not too dissimilar to the Cooper style curve. Yeah, you can see that. That's almost the same shape. Um, this is obviously a Cooper's tool. I and Cooper is barrel, barrel making, making, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. This is more for chair making, so it's a flatter um, tool, and this is pro quite a good make for uh, for most chair makers things. This is quite a tight curve in here because of the way of the shape that we're working. So I think the, it's a combination of the Cooper style uh, um, score and in shave is useful for, for this sort of work and you'll see later on that I've got a uh, um, two travishers of different grades so there's a, a a number six and a number four which is predominantly what I use on my chair making and the number six should ad adequately work with this and we're just getting into that really deep curved territory So these, Neil, what are these you've got in your hand then? Well, these are some tools I've made up. Um, they're travishers. Um, I have the blades made up by a local blacksmith. Um, some of my early ones were made by um, Ben Orford. Uh, but these have been made up by uh, another guy called Richard Weaver. Um, he made up the metalwork. And then I've come up with this sort of uh, shape, uh, which sort of sits in the hand very well. They're basically like a curved spoke shave but they're curved in, in, in not only in that direction, but also this direction slightly. And then again, a bit like a spoke shave. This one's a number six, which is the deepest curve. This one is a number four, slightly shallower. And I've got others all the way down to zero, which is a flat, flat version. And basically how we use these is uh, making sure that the blade is obviously away from us. And we'll, here I'm just cleaning up the top of this um, ash which we axed and I'm just trying to find the air out, finding the, the way the grain and I know that the grain is here is running up to me so you can see in that spiral the grain has changed even though we're trying to put a flat so the, the grain is coming up this way here and here it's moving that way so I've just got to be really conscious 
of which way the grain runs in both ways. But all I'm doing is just flattening it out. Taking off the high spots to start. So you can get quite a bit of rapid removal. Now you're just running the other way basically. Yeah, just to, I'm following the grain again. As I mentioned before, the grain that side is coming this way, the grain this side is coming this way. So it's obviously as it's twisting around the tree, uh, that movement, that, that wind in the tree. See how much easier that was really working with the grain that way. Now if I just come back around this way and I'll, I'll work the opposite direction, you can see how it's just pulling up. Mm. That just shows you've got to work with the grain. So for those watching that maybe don't have this particular tool, could they use just a normal plane? Or? Yeah, normal plane's fine. But what this is doing is putting a little scoop, um, a, a curved, and you get like this fluted, almost like the, uh, the, the the patterns in the sand when the sea's been around. And I quite like that. It, to me, it, that's just facet working. It just knows it's handmade. Because mm -hmm. if you get it all you know belt sanded or flattened with with sanders you just lose a little bit of the sole and it's a bit like the finger marks in a uh, with a, a potter and his pots and that's what it is with, with greenwood working it you're working with a, a tool which is putting some marks in and you can tell that, uh, that what worker has done uh, how good his tools were how sharp his tools are i mean there's uh, some of the archaeologists that go round uh, looking at old cathedrals, they can look at the timbers in them and they can actually work out which which person has worked which bit of timber because of the axe marks. Wow. <laughs> That's quite something, isn't it? So if he's got a chip in his axe or whatever, they could tell it was him, that whoever he was or she was. The other, the other key thing is if, if this is yet flat but a roughish surface, when you're you, um, with your wedge that will sit on here that's going to keep the, the ramp coming mm -hmm. up, it actually um, will grip the timber a lot better. So you don't, you don't want it dead flat and so, because it, it'll just scoot around all over the place, whereas if you've got a bit of a rough surface it will. Once again, people can use a normal plane. For yeah, that's a normal plane. plane. A normal plane or a scrub plane. What's, um, a, what's um, a scrub plane? Well, plane. basically a scrub plane's got a slightly curved um, iron. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's what I would use on this. It's just that uh, um, I'm using this tool because we, you know, I've done the seat within it. It works just equally well. Now I can remove a lot of timber with this. So yeah, from the axe cuts that I probably didn't really take a lot off but there we go now all I'm doing I'm just working the surface Make. as I say other people will do other things this is just my way of doing it because it's the tools I've got to hand and like anybody else will use what they've got in their arsenal to uh, and, it, and, it's, and, and that's all I would say to anybody really is don't be afraid, have a go. You might not have exactly the right tool, but you'll get somewhere near it. And what's going to happen is, because uh, it's really green, that will oxidise and it'll almost go orange. So you were mentioning off camera the Obviously this is green wood, um, but as it dries it will slightly distort. Yeah, um, yeah, if you can imagine now, this is the underside of the log. So the log that's on the top, if the pith line is down the middle, so this part of the log will actually smile away from the centre of the timber. So you'll end up, if you have a look at this, this, this was dead flat across here. Yeah, and what's happened? is it's, it's, it's actually shrunk. What's happened is all the cell structure inside the timber closes up and they all pull together. So what you may have done flat here is actually twisted and, sh and shaped. So that's what will happen to that. Interesting. 
So, um, and what you'll do is you'll come at some point in a few months time and you'll just plane it back. It'll take a, a good, good while for this to dry out. Maybe a couple of years left out in the open like this. Oh, so that long then? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, um, it, to air dry it, mm -hmm. a one inch plank, to air dry it, it will take an inch of thickness per year to dry. Is that how it is? Oh wow, I didn't yeah. realise it was that long. And that's only getting it down to 15% if yeah. you're lucky. To try and uh, get that dry, so you've got what, four inches there? So to get it down to 15% you're probably going to get about, I don't know, two, three, maybe four years at maximum. And that's what's happened to that over the time. So, but that's quite an old, I don't know, 10, 15, 15 years old now maybe, something like that. Still going okay, the frame needs replacing. The body's okay, legs might need replacing. And that's the beauty of them, as they wear out, you just add bits to it. So, you know, there'll be shave horses, I'm sure, in the country that's been going on bit by bit. And when the body goes, then that's the time to replace everything. So you can see now from that that there's uh, here is still quite a bit, bit of a crown on it. So we could work, we could work that a lot more, but I'm not going to be too bothered. At the end of the day, it's, it, it isn't like we need to. Uh, if you take this off and use it as a flat surface for working on, then yes, you will need to plane it. But for just a, a, the purposes of the shave horse, that's that's fine in my book. But now, not what we've got to do now in the next section is just really work this a bit more so that it fits your um, posterior. Yeah, well, it fits your leg a bit better. And what I'm going to do is actually just chop that edge out there round that off, do the same on this side so that your leg will sit into that and I'll go and get the ads and we'll do a bit more work on it This is a beast of an ad, this one Yeah, it's um, uh, got it from uh, off eBay actually but it was uh, it's an East German made one and it was in a real rough state to handle it all rotted um, I had to re-grind it and it's been re-profiled a few people I know, bowl cars that have used it and have added additions to it and with a, with a grade of um, angles of, uh, of uh, sharpening and grinding. Uh, so it's had a little bit of work on the inside as well as the outside. Great for doing bowls by the way, but it'll work on this sort of work as well. So, so it's actually quite a, a deep cut on it. See what I'm trying to do is just round this edge. Yeah, so uh, and again we can just take it out in there, right out in there. So long story short for folks that are following along, um, just basically use whatever tools you have to hand just to get a similar effect basically isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, you might have a gauge. I'd recommend if you've got a deep gauge you could easily do that with this mm -hmm. and then work it down with the flatter gauge to get it smoother and then with a scraper blade you'd get it down to that but at the end of the day you just want to curve. It doesn't matter if there's a, a slight raised um, faceted feel to it because I quite like that anyway as a, as a look mm -hmm. um, and, and at the end of the day it's a working tool. That's the key thing with this. So it's taken a long while to get to this point, but it's all been done by hand pretty much. So now we're just pausing obviously uh, in between obviously shaping the um, the main part of the shave horse with the hand tools. Uh, now obviously what you're demonstrating now is do the same process that we use with wedges and uh, the axes to split the main log in half and now you're doing it with a chainsaw, is that correct? Yeah, what we're using now is a, a, a mill, an Alaskan mill on a, a three foot bar of a um, uh, big large chainsaw and what we're going to do is we've actually cut that in half now to create two large flitches in effect, one will be the body, the other part which has been left on that log we're going to uh, mill a plank off that, which is going to be about one and a half inches in thickness. Um, and the, the reason now that we've done that, we can actually, uh, we've opened it up and you can see quite uh, the story of the tree of how it's grown really. If you have a look here, how it's in its early days as a tree, it's quite pendy and sinuous all the way through the pith line, which, which 
suggests that uh, although it looks a nice straight tree, that's why we had all that wind in the uh, in, in the other tree, yet the other one that we were working yesterday. So that's why we're showing you how to mill it as well to get decent timber out of it. And obviously, needless to say, the chainsawing aspect side of things you only do obviously if you're trained. And, yeah, fully you know. trained. You have to go through uh, courses for uh, just basic courses, and then you really need, if you're going to buy these things, you really need to get get some training with them as well because they are quite fearsome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So with this one, obviously, the goal of this video is to show you the different variations of how you process the timber, hand tools, and obviously now we're looking at the chainsaws. So um, are you ready to go then? In yeah, terms we're of good to go. So what we've got here, we've got some wedges set up, and these will actually be fed into the cut as we move through, just to keep the cut open so it doesn't bind with the chain. Right, I'm going to get started up. So here we have the finished plank now. Yeah, um, as you can see, we've opened it up, and you can see that telling the story of this tree is not—it's not been a well-grown. Two dead knots here, obviously branches that have grown off um, and uh, broken off or died in its uh, life, dropped away, and the tree's grown around it. Um, you can see just by milling that, that, that this tree must have been under quite a lot of stress, but because it's just opened up, literally seconds ago on both ends so in terms of a plank uh, we'll get stuff out of it because we're going to break this down into smaller parts so I'm not too bothered but this will obviously get cut out and uh, we'll be using here and along here and these two bits here so we'll get some decent timber for what we want which is the frames of the uh, of the uh, um, shave horse so there we are but <laughs> Amazing isn't it? Uh, I, I love opening up the trees in this respect because it, it tells the story of how the tree's grown. In this case not very well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, But this has come from a plantation where it's not been maintained for 40 odd years. So Neil, the next phase is using the offcuts um, and am I right in saying you're now going to make the legs? Yep, yeah, we're going to um, cleave this in half. Um, these are obviously the, 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 the pieces that were taken off and uh, we're not usable for the, the, the actual body, but we don't waste it. We try and use as much out of this, the, the tree as we can. So we'll get a couple of legs out of this and out of another piece that we've got, we'll make the third leg for the, the shave horse. They're going to be a, a tapered leg, so they'll be thicker at the bottom, coming up to a one and three inch um, tenon at the top. Perfect. All good to go. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to cleave this and um, by using a uh, maul and a fro. And how I start using a fro is I just raise it so the tip, I'll just use my finger there, the tip is just on the edge of the timber. And we're doing it, um, um, if we're uh, sort of measuring up, it's, uh, I try and get it halfway round the bark size, so half and half. That's how, and we're trying to split it in, in directly in half. So. You, where I strike is above that point where the um, fro is touching the timber. There's a slight gap here and we just give it a good strike and that's now locked it in. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten that off and then we're going to see where that wind actually takes us in terms of the timber. Now because I've left a bit of the bill sticking through I can actually drive that down. I can then turn it round and pop that through just to make the bill stick out a bit further 
turning it around, striking it down again and again. You can see the crack that's opening up following the way the grain direction is. Okay, so we'll just keep going. Now I know that I'm at a point now I can feel the tension in the timber is removed and I can now lever this. Now I put my hand over the back end and there's two or three ways, well a couple of ways, you can either push or pull towards you but uh, what I tend to do is put my knee up against it holding it and I'm pulling towards me. You can see it opens the cut by levering. That way, let's put the throw down and that leaves me with two halves. Now what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to split this again actually and get rid of the waste on this edge piece because that's too thin for anything and we're going to get two nice legs out of that so I'll pop that down on that side there and I'm going to create again half and half ish try and lose this waste piece and leave us with a nice big piece of timber here. So raising up and it's just a matter of twisting the uh, piece of timber around, hitting the throw in different directions and just seeing how this is going to split trying to keep it fairly straight as we go round you can just hear the timber cracking yeah and we're not far off one more drive and that should be oh that's just gone straight through that's great so there we've got our leg or the one leg made up and we could potentially get another leg out of that. It's a bit narrow at that end though, but you could maybe a chair leg or something if we were making those. So Neil, we've uh, cleavered off the pieces um, and now are you going to be using the axe to do what? To shape it up? Yep, yeah, yeah, we're going to create a, a rounded uh, leg from, you can see this triangular shaped piece. Okay, and um, we're going to take the corners off and get it into a round tapered leg. The end here will be a, a one and three eighths um, uh, mortise, uh, sorry tenon, to fit into a mortise of the same size which will fit in the base. But there's a lot of work to be undertaken. We've got to axe and draw knife uh, our way to that. So how to start with that, I actually hold this at about sort of 60 degrees. The axe is a side axe and as you can see it's got a flat on the one side so this is a right handed side axe. A normal axe would suffice though for the average person. Yeah, if you've got it. But what will tend to happen is with a, um, a normal side axe, is a, uh, sorry, a normal axe, is that as the bevel goes in, it will tip to the side mm -hmm. a little bit. So you've got to be aware of that with your, with your hand. Uh, what I would suggest most people do is choke the axe like this so you hold it right, right up by the head. And all I'm going to be doing is tiny little cuts, like feather cuts, and I'll just give you an example. So starting at the bottom, we're just going to do tiny little cuts coming up like this, severing the fibres up to halfway. And you can see we've got these feathers coming off and they just easily break off. Yeah, turn the timber around. One, two, three. Um, just work our way up. You see I'm keeping the axe vertical and the timber's um, at about 60 degrees. And when I come to take off those, I just raise the timber up, keeping the axe vertical all the time move them off, turn it around okay and then we're going to take the bark off as well so we've got it um, almost sort of six sided and we're going to work this a little bit more just to take the, the corners off flatten them out a bit more so we'll end up with a, a six sided piece of timber See, I'm just going for a round. You haven't actually got it. You could keep them quite triangular shaped as well if you wish. So that would give you a bigger footprint on the on the ground. So if you imagine we can tidy that up in there. And perhaps we'll do that with this one. Just 
take the corners off. Take the bark off. Okay, so we've got this sort of tapered shape. Bear in mind we're going to bring this down even more at the end here, so this will be a one and three eighths tenon. So that's um, nearly there. Just going to take this end off here. And you can see there's a few straps from the cleaving which we've got to remove because we don't want any cracks showing in the timber. And that's probably not far off, but I'm going to just do a little bit more there. So essentially the, the end where the tenon is going is slightly thinner basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I think we'll do is we'll keep it a nice triangular shape, big chunky and heavy so it'll sit on the ground well, but this will then get shaped from a triangular shape to a round shape. And what we're going to do that is now go on to the shave horse to do that. So with the axe, um, you were just wanted to mention something, didn't you? Yeah, just about axe safety. It's, it's really just so people are safe when using it. I've talked about choking up the axe, which allows you to control the head a lot easier than holding it down here where the weight of the handle will move around. I've also talked, this particular block which I use has got this, this upstand here, so it stops the, the timber moving outwards. You can hit that quite happily and it doesn't move off the block. I know that a lot of people use the blocks and they'll have a depression in it and hold it in, but you still get a lot of movement in the in the the, the timber. So putting it up like so. Now with axe work, I tend to want to put my what I teach is I tend to want to put the uh, piece of timber towards the other side of the axe block, that leaving you plenty of space on this side to, for the axe should you miss to go into the block. So ultimately you don't want to be chopping here, if you miss the block it could end up being in your leg. So if you have it out here, you're chopping and if you miss it's going to hit the block. One final thing, um, when you're chopping um, stand to the left with it if you're a right handed axe user, stand to the left of the line of the axe so that if you did miss the block it's going to miss you. Okay, so and that's just basic axe safety really and that way you should remain safe so if you do miss and it bounces out that's what will happen it'll hit the block not you the other final thing is when you've finished with the axe I tend to either stand it up or in this case just place it underneath the block that way it's not going to hurt anybody what I, do, what I don't use and I don't advocate is people ramming the axe into the, the chopping block a lot of people use chopping blocks to stand on to get to height from whatever, so you might get grit and everything in here and you're going to slam into that. That's not what you want. So I'll just tend to leave it on the ground nice and safe. Okay. So now we're on a shave horse now then, Neil? Yeah, so now we've got this set up. I'm using this um, uh, nodding donkey style shave horse. It's the one that I tend to use. I know that we're making the, uh, the old Bodgers pattern uh, shave horse, but this is the one I tend to use myself. It's a more general purpose um, shave horse um, and it clamps well, do lots of things with this, even spoon carving and what have you. I've seen people use it for. So, again, nice seating position. Whenever you, again, safety wise, try not to hold and move the timber around. You don't want to be holding a shave horse because that can tip around and, and cut the back of your hand. So always try to pop the uh, um, blade away from you and then you can move the timber around in the shave horse quite happily with two hands. Okay, get it secure. Make sure that you've got enough pressure with your foot on the treadle so that that timber doesn't come out. I'm putting that under quite a, not too much pressure but there's enough there for it not to slide out and hit me in the chest, which is what can happen if you don't put enough pressure. Another thing that I use on this type of shave horse is this little bit of a leather patch here and it just grabs grabs the uh, the, the timber. And we can do the same on the Bodger's pattern, we can, we can add leather to that as well. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up my um, draw knife now, just get this into a position and I'm gonna work the bottom end of the leg first. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to lose all the axe cuts 
and any uh, straps that we uh, so we've got a nice and I'm not too bothered about the final shape because at the end of the day this is a working tool it's not going to be a refined piece of furniture although you can make that as well While you're doing this, I mean, it might sound like a bit of a dark question, but let's say someone doesn't have a shape horse to do this, uh, because obviously they're making yeah, it. Yeah, right? well, I mean, so you, you, you could actually, um, I have seen uh, shave horses, sorry, um, uh, draw knives used in a, in a vice, you know, with a, with a vice, so you could actually clamp and use that. You just have to be extra careful that you do hold both hands and you get a good standing position mm -hmm. and work with that. Um, ultimately, it's always nice to have a sit down, so I would recommend <laughs> Any excuse to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good excuse to sit down. So we're just going to be... Uh, nice and green timber. Uh, I'm just sort of sorting out the leg. It's, it's, you know, it's just a triangular shaped leg at the end of the day, but what will happen is we're going to turn that around, and now we can start to bring this down to a, a rounded finish. Um, always make sure when you're using a, shape, uh, a draw knife that you have both hands around it and a good grip with your thumb. Um, there's two ways of using it. You can see from this I've actually got the flat of the draw knife down because I'm just smoothing it off really in effect. But if you really want to dig in uh, you can turn it over the other way so that bevel is down and that really does bite into the uh, in see how much hard that is to, to do so I'm, I'm using it that way around for now because I'm, I'm just shape, shaping it off getting rid of all those axe cuts and we're going to try and turn it into a rounded shape If you get a bit of a piece of timber that sort of is difficult or is a bit knotty and it bites, what you can do is, see if that's grabbed like so, you can actually lift by twisting your wrists, it just lift and the fibres will, will open up and then it can finish you off. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start rounding off the top here. Okay, so a bit more work on this I think just to try and taper it down a little bit. So Neil, now that it's been shaped up with a draw knife, what's next? Right, so the next thing is what I'm going to do is put a round tenon on this. I know it's green, a lot of people put the tenons on when they're, when they're dry, the legs, and you can do that, that's not a problem. But because we're trying to get this all done uh, throughout one session, what I'm going to be doing is t t turning these green. And bear in mind it's going to be tapered anyway, so the shoulder at the end is what's going to lock it into the mortise. So we're going to put in a, a, a tenon round about two inches in length and that will sit neatly into the base of the, uh, the, the, the shave horse body. So how I do this, again we can, still sitting on our shave horse, we can clamp it and this is the beauty of why I like this particular shave horse because it allows me to do these legs. So what is it you're using here then? So this is a rounder plane, um, this is a very old one. Um, I inherited this. Um, there are a there is a company called Asham Crafts that make these in Britain. Um, I, I think they're still um, operating. So this is a, a version of that. Um, there used to be a guy here in Telford who used to make these, um, but uh, he passed away a few years back. 
and they used to do great big versions like this, three inches in diameter. This one, as I say, is an inch and three eighths, and it works really well with the um, the uh, Scotch Eye auger that I've got that pairs up to the tenon size on this. Right, so it's just a matter of simply clamping the um, piece of wood in your shave horse and it's turning clockwise and as you can see you put a bit of pressure we've got a, a blade which is uh, well it is basically a spoke shave blade and we're going to turn that and we create these shavings makes good fire lighting material um, when that's dried out you know good for you bushcrafting guys fantastic for that um, so, just, got, so just one quick thing for those that don't have this tool would like just some refiner work with right. a knife and stuff just you, you could just use um, use your 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 um, tenon cutter uh, sorry not a tenon cutter your uh, scotch eye auger or your um, a bracing bit whatever size you've got to and you can just drill a, a mark in the end so you know exactly what you've got so if it's an inch and three eighths, which is great, or an inch, you can put a tenon on that, just mark it with the ears, and that'll give you a mark that you can then draw a knife down to. Bear in mind this is green, so, uh, it, so the, the, the end, it would just give you a mark at the end, and you could actually draw a knife it off very carefully. To make life a bit simpler, I'm using one of these. Now, because it's tapered, I'm just going to ease that back and I can just to show you, we've got a brass ring in here which is a um, stop it rubbing basically, the, the aluminium which is soft and you can see it's just starting to bite on the shoulder so I have get back with my draw knife and I can just remove that down a little bit more and you can start to see there's a shoulder being built up here, nice straight tenon and then it's shouldered out. I'm just going to turn it around and see how it's rubbing on the timber here. So I'm just going to take that off. And as I say, we're looking for a, a straight tenon. We've only got about an inch on there at the moment. I'm going to look for about a two and a half inch maybe tenon on that. And that'll sit neatly into the body of the shape, of course. So now you've done that, now you're just doing the final shaping up. Yeah, I'm just all I'm doing is I'm just making it look a bit prettier, that's all. I want it to just sort of look tapered. Oh well, even though it's triangular shape to that end, I'm just trying to make it look a bit more pleasing to the eye. And you just have to be careful of the tenon that you've put on. And all I'm doing is I'm just grading it into that shoulder. So that becomes a, a sort of finished leg. So Neil, moving on to the next phase, uh, we've turned the main piece uh, on its head and so obviously this is the bottom part facing up, we've clamped it down and now obviously you want to look at the placement of the legs. Yeah, so where I'm stood is the, the, the seat end of the um, shave horse and if you have a look briefly we've got a central point that I've marked out halfway between and I've come back about four and a half inches and uh, from that central point I've done a two and a half inch marking which is going to give me the, the center point for the holes and we're basically going to drill at about a 25 degree angle and raking it out as well so we've got a rake and splay to give the legs well splayed out. So they're basically uh, bending out and then bending backwards basically. Yeah, so we don't have them out and vertical that way they're actually angled in two directions. Okay. Rake and splay. So that's on the back uh, on the front end, there'll be uh, one leg straight down the middle, like so. So this is going straight out, yeah? Straight out, but again that is angled out away from the, uh, um, the body, so you've got a three-point contact with the ground, really uh, well splayed out legs, which is going to make it um, a good contact with the ground and it won't tip over then when you're sat on it. Perfect. So now to bore the holes, what are you using? Right, what I've got here is a 1 and 3 8 Scotch eye auger. Now, the eye part is obviously this piece at the top here, and there's a hand, wooden handle goes through, and it's basically turned in a clockwise direction to cut. The Scotch part of the name of it is actually to do with the cutter. 
you'll um, if you've got a um, a brace and bit you'll see that on the Jennings or Irwin style pattern there'll be an ear here that cuts a nice true hole this is a bit more aggressive and a bit more of a, um, a rough cut to it but you'll see there's a sharp edge there and a sharp edge here and that just really cuts out a hole and obviously so you want this basically and I'm stating the obvious here but for the purposes of the video it's got to be the same thickness as the tenon basically yeah. so this is one and three eighths the the tenon cutter that we used previously has put the uh, tenon or the rounder plane has put the tenon onto the end of the legs. We're drilling out the mortise now, which is going to be a round mortise. Cool. Okay, so good to go. All good to go. Right, what we're going to do now is we're. I'm just eyeing this in. I don't. I use about a 25 degree angle, so um, it's angling out 25 degrees, degrees from a vertical point here, and also from a vertical point this way. So. They're well splayed out and I'm just going to twist and get the screw to bite into the timber. Once these are in position and adjusted you can alter them but you have to back them off and I'll, I'll just talk through that as I'm doing it. So now I've got it pretty much set at the angle that I want, I'm going to start drilling in. And the lead screw on it is pulling it into the fibres and you can see I'm just Now if you think that you've made a slight uh, discrepancy with the angle, what you can do is you can back, back it off. And the reason you do that is you can actually, now the, the lead through thread is in a, a, a slightly enlarged hole because you've backed it off and you can alter it to suit which angle that you want. Okay. And the reason that I say back it off, because if you've got this lead screw, if you try and bend that when it's in the wood uh, tight, you're likely to break the tip off. And well, that's just, you might as well throw it away then. That's a very useful tool um, that's gone. <laughs> so treat your tools with respect in that case. So let's go back to drilling. And get it into the hole. And happy with the angle. In terms of depth, what are you looking at roughly? Right, well, there is two ways of looking at this. You can do a stopped mortise, so the hole doesn't come all the way through, um, which we might do that in this case. Or you can go a through mortise, where the end of the leg sticks right through and you just cut that off to suit. That way, you know that you've got a real good depth of tenon inside the timber. And it's up to you what do you want to do there. If you want to be in, for, for, from a structural point of view, is there a difference between the yeah, one structurally the the, uh, the one going through is obviously going to be stronger. Um, but uh, from an aesthetic point of view, if you only go so far in, um, you are not going to see a nasty hole the other side. But you can you can wedge if you go through, you can wedge it so the legs are permanently fitted. Mm -hmm. We'll have a chat about that in a little little while when we've got them in. But I think what we'll try and do with this, because your, your particular shave horse that you're making will uh, need to have a removable legs, so they don't need to go all the way through. Uh, the only, uh, the, and I'm saying that because I'm almost minded if you do go all the way through, you can actually tap the legs out with a, um, a pin the other side. Because mm -hmm. if they, if they uh, um, are uh, stuck. It's a little bit awkward to try and pull them out if you haven't got a, a through tenon. So there's uh, pros and cons for both <laughs> and it's up to you what you want really. So uh, what we've done now is we've drilled the, the hole and it's gone in three and a half inches thereabouts. The actual tenon on this is about three inches so we're going to get a nice gap in the bottom so that means it'll tighten up on the uh, on the shoulder of this. Just going to tap that in. I'm not going to tap it all the way in but I've tapped it in enough to give me guidance for when I drill the next hole. Mm -hmm. So I've got something to refer to. And uh, if I get the, the uh, Scotch Eye organ out, uh, this is the bit that uh, everybody has a little bit of a problem with, but now I'm looking at the central line that I've got here, you can see now that I've got a reference point. So as long as the angle's somewhere near, I can, I can start drilling. 
So just get the screw thread in. This side should be okay. Right, just make sure I've got, just back it off, make sure I've got the angle right and I'm happy with the central position, happy with that direction as well, and then we're away. So you can see by when the legs are, are in, there's quite a distance apart at the bottom end. They're quite tight at the top end, but very far apart, so that angle is about 25 degrees from the vertical in both directions, it's quite important. So these two are red and now you're looking at the one at the back. Yeah, so what I'm going to try and do is I've got to make sure that we're vertical down the line of the body and we're also going to do this at 25 degrees from the vertical coming back this way so it's going to splay out about 25 degrees. Trying to keep it vertical down the body. As we've had this in a sort of a bit of a triangle shape, the back of the uh, so this is the bark side. I always put inside the uh, just drive that in. Yeah, it's pretty good. But as I say, that's tight. But as this leg dries. You'll probably need to just tap it in a bit more into the into the hole um, because of the shrinkage. Because of the shrinkage, so it'll go from a round shape that we've got to a slightly oval shape, and that's just not natural with greenwood working. But because this is not a chair, it's just a working tool. The leg will uh, will fit anyway because it'll just go down onto the tapered shoulder. That's it. So that that body's done. Just tap these out. So here we go in all its glory. The first face is looking the, the business now, Neil. Oh, well, there we go. A lot of, a lot of hard work going into it. We've got to do the um, traditional booty check. <laughs> That's right, sure. Yeah. That's uh, it. Well, that, that works well, yeah. That's all right. I was just saying um, before about using this as a, a, a another sort of bench as well, as well as using a draw knife for a shave horse. You can actually use this back. We can flatten off the back and use this as a clamp. So you can actually have a round piece of timber for making, uh, cutting tenons on with your tenon cutter. Interesting. So, and, and again, that just, you're acting that, have, using that as a, a work surface. And so you were saying that we can also attach a clamp, can't we, like a vise yeah, or something? Yeah, you can, uh, uh, one of these little um, vices as well with a mm -hmm. screw thread onto it and that will fit onto there as well. And so you've got a little bit of a multi-purpose work bench really that you can take to shows or wherever into the woods. So uh, it, it all works. So Neil, what's next in the process? Right, what we've got to do here, we, we did cut this plank. Now, had there not been a wind in the tree, we'd have been cleaving these and draw knifing them up. We can still do that, but we planked this up yesterday with the, um, the machine. So we've got, and you can tell this is really fresh and it must have hit the ground because we've had some shake come in it. You see how, the, and it's now showing the true colours of how the tree started off in growth. So it's a bit, but out of that, we're going to make um, four pieces, so for the two shave horses. This is the frame, the side of the frame. If you have a look on the old uh, one there that we've had, we've got it, that, that's me made out of a branch, but we're going to be using two black pieces. It's going to be a bit more stable with this. Um, now what we're going to do is I've I'm going to measure about three and a half inches from this live edge. So we'll keep the live edge on, on it and we're going to measure about 40 inches in length just to give us enough to be able to cut the true length of what we need. And I've got three and a half inch measurements on there and I'm just going to mark that down. Okay, and then we're going to, we'll cut that out and then we're going to mark another one on here, another one down here, another one down here, lose, losing this bit of uh, dead knots that won't play part of, our, of what we're doing. So we're going to saw this down now using this uh, panel saw. Um, just a safety tip here, just to start the cut off, if you get your thumb planted down vertically and your knuckle will rest up against the plank, uh, sorry the side of the saw and uh, just by doing that we can uh, see how that's working. It's just stopping the saw from waggling around. Now the next thing to consider when you're sawing is making sure your saw 
your forearm, your upper arm and your shoulder are all in a line so that uh, it's not over there and it's not here so you're not bending the saw because that's when the saw will, will actually trap. So nice movement, steady movement. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping the pencil line on the left hand side of the saw. I'm just sawing that down vertically. Okay, so what we've got here is that is a bit of a, an issue now with the, the cut that we're um, trying to get through this timber. The end is closing up, that's because of the grain, uh, the way it is, it's trying to shut the cut up. So what you can use is a little technique, put a wedge in, you can see how that's just opened that up. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it just forces slightly up. Be careful you don't over tap that in because it will just put a split straight down your timber and you can see what's happened naturally. So. You can carry on sawing. So Neil, we're obviously marking up another piece, okay, same for the leg. Uh, you were mentioning something about utilising the waves uh, yeah, and the yeah, curves. Yeah, as you can see from the, the, uh, the other two that have been cut out, we've got two nice straight pieces off the top of the um, plank. At the bottom of the plank we've actually got the, you can see where the curve of the tree has been growing. Although it looks straight sided, there is the actual natural curve of the tree when it, in its early stages of life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that split that's already occurred, because that's the natural uh, cleaving line. And you can see following down the actual grain, that's what we're going to be cutting out. And what I'll do off that is I'm going to measure, again, three and a half inches following that curve all the way around and just Luckily, oh, so it's quite it comes, a dynamic shape then. Yeah, so it's um, it actually is a, a more organic uh, shape to the because we're, we're actually working in, in, in conjunction with nature. So okay. what I will do is I'll cut that curve off and then I'll scribe the line along that side and we'll cut that out. And then what we'll do is I'll use that as the template. We'll turn the plank over and we'll use the natural curve the other way to create the, the other half of it. Ah, interesting. Okay, okay, so now what we've got now is we've got the curve cut, nice shape up to it, following the grain. And what I'm going to do is, following that three, uh, three and a half inch line, I'm going to scribe this now, using my end of a square here, and we can just follow that around, following the shape of the curve on the inner side. Okay, so that's, that's that done. So that's going to be a nice curve on that. We'll cut that out and then we'll uh, uh, transport it over to this side. What we'll do is we'll put a curve like that. And you can see that there is a, a natural curve there that we can then transfer onto that side. Actually, I've got to cut that off yet. Does that make sense? Yep. So we'll, it'll come over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's what right, knocking the cameraman out. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll fit something like that. So, but we, uh, let, me, uh, let me finish cutting it and it'll become more apparent. Okay, so now what we've got, we've turned the plank over this bottom piece and we've used that other curve and we're going to mirror image or use the top one as a template and you can see the curve is naturally replicated there. And I'm just going to, the reason I've come in a little bit, there's a slight crack from the centre pith line which I want to remove because we don't want that in and I'm just going to shake that up like so and come down the other side You were mentioning something about the curve and the way it helps with the shave horse Yeah, um, okay so if you can imagine, let's use this shave horse here um, if you have the, 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 um, the, the straight piece and the curved piece together if we were to use the straight piece first, when it's moving, you can see that it takes a lot more with your feet to push it over to clamp the timber. And if you've got a curved piece, that actually hits the timber a lot sooner. Interesting. So it actually so, helps with the ergonomics. Yeah, of the, it is. Yeah. So that, that's one of the reasons for using a, a curved piece. And it could be branch wood. We've got a, um, a, a sinuously plank that we've taken it from. You can see the curve, the natural growing curve of it, but it could have been a branch, a bent branch, 
that we could have uh, cleft in half and worked it and done that but we've just speeded up the process. Perfect. So Neil for the next component we're making this top piece here right? Yeah the, what, the, what the, we've got this is the, plank. this is the ramp and all the plank that's on here um, this is what will clamp um, all the timber that's going to be draw knifed. Mm -hmm. So everything will rest on here it gets supported by a wedge. This is an old star version it's a bit shorter than the one we're making um, we're going to be obviously using this to be a lot more support but with yours a lot longer legs so it'll mm. be a, a lot heavier on the ground. Perfect. Okay so what we're doing now is we've got this um, slightly air dried plank it was uh, only planked a few months back um, although the tree's been down a lot longer than that and I'm going to lose the, uh, the, the, the splits that are in the end we're marking it up at 35 inches and we're going to do two planks of that, one for each of our shave horses. So just to mention on camera, we're actually making another shave horse in parallel. Yeah. Uh, uh, one for the centre and the yeah. one, one that I'm taking away. So, um, so yeah. So these two are marked up, so now it's just a simple... Well that's the length. Things. We've obviously now got to uh, cut the, obviously mark up the width as well. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is we'll take the best of the timber, we'll lose the live edges and we'll take down the centre. Cool. And so, in terms of the width, then, how are you working out the width? Um, is, well, it, is it based on the, the, the width of the... Yeah, so the, the plank will be the same width as the, the body itself. In this case, this one's six inches. The other one, because we could get a seven inch width on that, will be, the, will be seven inches. Uh, and it just... The wider the plank you can get, mm -hmm. the bigger the bits of timber in you can get, really. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to understand that the the old bodgers were just making chair legs, mm -hmm. so anything above um, two inches was not really needed. Right. To be honest. So Neil, so we've gone ahead and made the block that sits underneath. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's just a wedge that um, helps keep the ramp at the right angle. And it, it is adjustable, so by getting a higher plank height, you, you can push the, plank, uh, the wedge in it to whatever height you want. Um, as you can see, it just goes up a bit higher. And that, so you've got several different adjustments now. You've got the adjustment that will pattern with the holes in the, the, the actual frame, which we're going to do next and also the height can be adjusted so depending on what size of timber it is you get a good effective grip by adjusting the height of the frame and also the height of the ramp. And so some of the ergonomics of the wedge itself, do you want to just talk about that? Yeah, so if we have a quick look, it's been roughed out with a chainsaw in this particular case. Um, it's just an angled block. Now a lot of people have their uh, high point at, right at the back. I tend to bring mine a little bit further forward so it just helps um, with the timber underneath and you haven't got this fulcrum, there is a little bit of a fulcrum point there but that means you can bring the block right in or push it right up, you've actually got the high point a little bit further forward um, and until we get the frame on uh, that will explain it things a little bit better. And just one last thing, on the top um, obviously you've angled up the, uh, just on the wedge, yep. so if you lift that board up for a second, uh, so on the wedge here uh, you were saying that typically that would go all the way across. Yeah, that, yeah that should go all the way across um, uh, in terms of, uh, um, but because this is made out of a roundish log, you've still got these edges, but you've, you've still got a good plant of uh, timber on that. Um, it's, again, it's, it's what we're finding out of the timber. That's just an old bit of uh, ash that's been lying around. So Neil, you mentioned something, and I thought it's important to get this on camera, uh, an option for making the wedge underneath. Yeah, what, what we've got is, as I say, that's made out of one big lump of timber. And for those people who may not be able to um, find big round timber and are going to buy lumber, that's already milled material. So you could have a plank for the seat. The legs could be made out of um, um, larger pieces of uh, milled timber. Uh, the other thing is, is that the wedge you could actually make out of a plank as well. So this is just some broken off cuts of... Uh, of timber and we could then basically mark up the the, the style of um, the wedge and probably four maybe five pieces could be bolted together oh, uh, of the same shape right. and then that could be your wedge underneath so you haven't actually got to go 
create a, a massive wedge out of one big lump of timber. Perfect. So Neil, we move on to the next phase. Um, and so obviously we're going to be doing some turning now to do the last of the pieces. Yeah, on the pole lathe, yeah. Yeah, on the pole lathe. Do you want to talk about the pieces then that we need to... Well, if we refer to the uh, this older version that's uh, been around a while now, um, you can see there's a frame that sits over the whole of the body. And what we have is the there's the top piece here which will clamp onto um, the timber. And it's your feet that pushes out uh, onto... Uh, away from where you're sitting and that clamps here. On the pivot point we've got a handle here which is freely taken out. We've also got a top piece and we've got a uh, um, piece here. Now what we're going to be doing slightly different, this has got two pins, we're going to actually be putting a pin at an angle straight the way through so we can uh, um, have the piece of timber on either side of that. It's just the way that I do uh, on mine because it really does actually anchor the plank onto the uh, or the ramp onto the onto the body of the shave horse. So um, if we can have a look at that with uh, the body of yours, which is at six inches, so we know that the pieces here and the bottom have got to be six inches in the middle. They'll be about two inches in thickness to create a good solid piece and then off these will be two ears or tenons that will sit through the frame of the uh, um, shave horse frame um, top and bottom and and they'll be different lengths well, obviously longer at the bottom to get your feet on and at the top uh, they'll be reasonably short all this will be held together by um, wooden pins or in this case a very dry oak you can see they just go on the top. On the old example, the these are broken off, and they've probably just been uh, originally were held in by a pin there. You can see a wooden pin which is broken, and and somebody's just done a really temporary version <laughs> repair on that, which isn't very good. What we'll be doing is coming through from the side here, so it's um, held in really tight, mm -hmm. and we can pull the pins out at any point in time. So. As a recap then, so we've got the, 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 the top piece which is yep. what clamps the, the, the actual objects in place that you're going yep. to be uh, using. And the then we're going to be using a uh, sort of pin which is the fulcrum of the frame sat through the body and then at the bottom piece will be a uh, piece for resting both our feet on which is going to act as the treadle area. And in terms of from the side view you're doing adjustment holes, is that yep. correct? Yeah, so the top one will have one or, um, one or two holes there for adjusting the height of the uh, uh, size of the timber that we've got. There's also another three holes here which will be used for adjusting the, the height again um, and also um, if you want a younger person to use your shave horse you can put more holes at the bottom. That's why these pins are most important to be able to take apart so you can adjust the whole frame to suit the individual who has sat on it. Um, the other thing is, is we're going to be doing this pin and you can see it's coming at an angle into the uh, body of the shave horse and that's when you're applying pressure by pushing your feet away with the frame and obviously the top is clamping down onto the um, the ramp what happens is this wants to force upwards the plank here so but if you put this in at an angle into the body that resists any movement interesting Okay. Uh, and then the final one in the middle here, you've got two adjustment holes as well. With the, yep, with the again, uh, uh, again for the sight or uh, height of the individual, you can adjust the frame forward or backwards depending on. Uh, so you've got height movement for the feet, <laughs> length of leg, also for the length of knees to move it away, and also for the height change um, for the size of timber. So th there's a lot of adjustments can be made with this to fit most people. So the way you've essentially done it is just like you said, you've got the ability to adjust quite significantly and also for it to be pat down then as well. Yes, uh, and that's it. So all this can be taken apart, legs can come out, the, um, the ramp can come apart, the frame can come apart and all this can go into the back of the vehicle, a per car in essential. Perfect. Okay, so those who want to go off to meets or whatever can take their own uh, frames, their own shave horses with them. So Neil, in order to make the components, we're going to be utilising the timber that we uh, cleaved off from before, didn't we, when we yeah. the ash? These uh, op, um, sort of offcuts will get used up. Um, if it doesn't get used up for uh, the components, it would have got used up for firewood. 
um, obviously needs a bit of air drying before that happens and all the shavings will get used up as well um, for different uh, small uh, the fires that we use on site so what we're going to do is we're going to split this up into uh, component parts bearing in mind we've just said about the three main parts of the frame uh, which is the the top piece the the um, fulcrum or handle piece and then the, where the feet fit so I'm going to try and get all three of those out of this one piece so using the fro again and the maul try and split this off so one thing you're going from the middle aren't you from the core yeah just taking out the uh, the pith line really because you don't want that in any of your uh, timber and we'll work probably the handle out of this piece and then we'll split this in a certain way where we'll get both the uh, the top part and the bottom part of the frame so that'll be for the handle and then I'm just going to try and orientate this to get the best as we can out of it um, looking at it we've got quite a thicker piece at the bottom but I'm just noticing we've got quite a crack in there so we may only get the one piece out of this let's see how we go so, good morning so let's just uh, hit that again knocking the bell down turning it around Yeah, and you see how that's followed through, almost gone through the crack. There is another one just there, which I'm going to have to try and take out. But I've got quite a big, chunky piece. You may just still get what I want out of that. And a lot of axe work, I think we'll get it off. Okay. okay so what we're going to do is, uh, we showed earlier on about using the axe work for the legs. And it's a similar process now. We're just going to make up the parts that we need. This is going to be far longer than we actually need, so I'll be cutting this down a bit. So what I'm going to try and do is just square it up into a, uh, a billet of a square shape rather than before I round it. I just want to get this making looking there the right sort of size. So when you're making the round pieces, you ideally want to get a square first. It well, gives you, it, it gives just, you good dimensions, basically. It just gives you something to work to. Bear in mind, all the bark's got to come off as well. And that can give you a false perspective of the timber. So you can start to see, we've actually got it slightly elongated. And I want to remove that. One side of that. Okay, so now I've got a square shape and it just gives me a reference point to work to again choking up the axe right up to the head and I'm doing these feathering cuts and then that will just ease off and what I'm looking for is making sure I've got it fairly straight sided again ever mindful about safety Trying to stand to the left of where the, the axe line is. In this case, because I'm a right handed uh, chap. Right, so now you can see there's a bit of a bow on here. Got this reasonably straight here. I'm now going to try and get this looking a bit more square shaped. So you've got this pretty, pretty square now, haven't you then? Yeah, but what I've done is, it was quite an irregular piece of timber, if you can see where, where it's come from. And I've just tried to follow the grain to get, get it nice and straight. So although it's squared off, I'm going to try and make this now into a little rounder billet by taking off the corners.
always keeping the axe head vertical. It's angling the timber, not the axe. That way the axe will work for you and not put more pressure on your wrist. Because if you start axing over here, you're not getting any control. Okay, so although that's quite a rough billet, probably a little bit more off the uh, one side, I think. So essentially you've gone from obviously a very irregular piece to a rough square to ten, taking the size and making it a, lot, a little bit more round. Yeah, basically. that's basically what it is. And it, ideally what you'll end up with is the octagonal shape. So from there, what I'll end up doing is take a bit more off that side. So now with the shave off, are you now just start, you know, trying to make it more round? or? Um... Yeah, we're just trying to make it more into a rounder shape. And what I'm also trying to do is remove all the axe cuts. So we don't want any of those in the timber itself. You get a bit of a spot like that, twist, you know, the, it just pulls it off. Okay, you can see there's some axe cuts in there, getting rid of those. Axe cuts here, let's pull that off. And then here, obviously, is where the that, uh, tangential split happened. We're going to remove that. And we're just trying to get it into a rounder shape, making sure all the axe cuts are off. So, you can see he's got an eight sided billet. So that's that one end. Now I've got that as a template. I can turn it over and work on this end. Pretty healthy slice of uh, slices off. Yeah, it's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Nice and fresh. Now, for all those who've got either a, a storm kettle, Kelly kettle, or gilly kettle, these are great for that. So you can dry these out and just feed them in. They'll burn beautifully. So all it, it all gets used. Okay. So I think I'd be happy enough with. That. We've got a fairly round billet, there's still a little bit in the middle, so we'll take that off. There we go. We're just trying to make it nice and straight, so that when we turn it, we'll just take off the bits that we need, the higher parts. Okay. So that is going to be a reasonable, we're not going to need it the full length of this, it's just that what was left over from the timber. So what I'll probably do is just cut it a little bit oversized. Now bear in mind we've got to do six inches for the middle, which is going to sit on the body. And then we've got to leave the ear, which is an inch and a half either side, and then a bit more for the top piece. The bottom foot piece will be even, even wider, so we can get a good foot on either side of it. So that will probably be okay from the bottom area. Um, we'll turn that, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make some more. So that's the one piece. So Neil, now that obviously we've roughed out the uh, the pieces, yep. so obviously now we want to turn them on a pole lathe uh, uh, to, to, to kind of make them round and obviously into the shape that we need. Um, do you want to do a quick discussion around the pole lathe itself? Well, basically it, it can, um, comprises of four main parts. There's the pole itself, which in this case goes beyond the fence, um, and uh, like so. And we also have the A-frame, which acts as the fulcrum. So if I just depress the treadle, you can see that that moves over that. So it's fulcrum on that 
uh, pole. The pole is about 18 feet length, um, maiden tree of an ash tree, and um, that's allowed to dry for six months mm -hmm. for use. Right. The next part will be the uh, main body of the, the lathe itself, and mm -hmm. uh, we've got um, two A-frames and with a bed attached, double bed. We've also then got two pockets. Um, people who are electric turning will know them as a headstock and tailstock, but they're called poppets in Greenwood turning. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've got there also in between those is a tool rest, which in this case is made from a piece of oak. Um, the headstock has a handle on it, you don't necessarily need that. Um, both the poppets are held on by wedges underneath the bed, so that locks it down into the and they're movable to the size of the timber that you're turning. Interesting. Yeah, the other final part is the obviously the treadle which uh, we set on. This has a, a movable head. So, so you with can that move, one... move the uh, string across with it, yeah. Right, gotcha. From one side to the other. Um, and basically, um, we're, it's an act of uh, the, you, the individual, creating the power and you're working in tandem with the springiness of the pole. So as I press down, the pole comes down and as I release my foot the pole takes over and brings the string back up. So it's this action of uh, moving up and down. This is why this is called a reciprocating lathe. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the actual piece turns forward and back, forward and back. Okay. Now if we start to introduce a tool, the first tool that I'll be using is this uh, roughing gouge. Now this is a very old blacksmith made one. We th well. I bought this at a car boot sale and it was covered in paint, um, not ground very well and I brought it back into use. Nice socketed uh, um, tool, um, works beautifully for what I want. I knew instantly when I saw it what it was, mm -hmm. so, uh, just nice to use. So we're going to introduce the tool, I've done a little bit to test it. So how we work this is I put my thumb underneath the tool, the four fingers across the top and my hand is resting on the tool rest. So um, just be aware of the treadle moving around Z so, and the pole. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to move the treadle and you can see the forward and motion backwards. Then I'm going to introduce the tool and as I push down the tool goes in, as I lift up the tool comes back. So let's speed it up a bit. So you're moving the tool as well as the actual now, because this uh, little bit of uh, the timber is slightly got a bend in it, I'm just going to try and take the high spots off. I think there's a high spot there. Can you see that? Really digging it out. And there's nothing being turned there. It's got a bit of a, a bow in it. We'll show you again in a moment how to set up the. Uh, the piece you're turning in between the poppets. And what we're doing here is we're actually turning the a piece that's going to go down at the bottom of the frame. So what we're going to end up is with a quite a thick piece in the middle and two inch tenons or it could be one and a half inch tenons on the end. So we've got a fairly round piece there, roughed out. Now, there's two ways of doing this. We can kick over the string and just carry on turning. Just taking off the high spots. You've always got to be mindful where that string is when you're turning. Don't know what the tool anywhere near the string if you can. Obviously we're turning ash here. If we've got sycamore you get some really nice ribbons coming off. Because ash is a ring porous tree. You see there's a lot of grain that you can see in the timber, as we've seen before. Sycamore is a diffuse porous timber and uh, 
it, it actually comes off the tree a lot nicer when turning. So we've got a few little flats here and there, not too bothered by those because they're going to get turned off. So the next tool that we would use, just bring that over to the left again, next tool we'd use is my uh, tool I had made by Nick Westerman and this is a, a combination of um, a flat turning chisel and a skew chisel. You can see this is an older version based on a picture I saw from a medieval painting and what we have also is a more modern version where you've got a flat two inch blade and a skew chisel and I can do all that with one but this is quite a fearsome tool <laughs> so you've got to really hold it as it can uh, so just pop those away now because we've uh, get the the, the tool rest even closer you see I can now do the same again hold it and what I'm doing I'm just going to smooth off all those rough edges first I'm getting it smoother so Neil do you want to talk through uh the way you're going to be working through this side? Yeah, so what, what we did previously is um, we've now measured this down to one and a quarter inch. Now this is where the foot part of the uh, frame will be, so my, my left foot would go here, my right foot's going to go there. This is the spacer, which is the same size or just slightly larger than the body of the shave horse. So the body of the shave horse is six inches, this is six and a quarter, so that makes the sure that the frame doesn't squeeze up on the uh, on the on the body of the just shavers. just to mention quickly we did this part off camera because uh, Neil just basically needed to check everything's working with the pole lathe so we're now going to show on camera this side here which is exactly the same process yeah so what we're going to do getting back to the roughing gauge I'm now going to remove this down A rapid removal of the uh, timber. Okay, I'm just going to change tools now. I'm going to go back to my uh, sort of flat edge uh, or uh, straight edge and a skew chisel combined and you can see I'm not far off inch and a quarter in width so we're going to take this end down first and it's a matter of cutting in with the point of the skew it's getting a little bit of furring up just want to check what size we've got we're just over the size so bear in mind we've got to be drilling a an inch and a quarter and I because this is still green remember and we're using gr green timber I'd, there is going to be a bit of movement when it dries but because we're going to lock it in with a pin I'm not too bothered about that and this is a, a tool that we're using Ideally, you'd probably just turn all these and get them um, uh, and let them to dry, mm -hmm. and then you could uh, um, refit the tenons to suit. So now I've got that end nicely sorted, I'm just going to come this in. And we're just going to check, yeah, that's fine, a little bit tight there. That's it, we're good to go. Yeah. Just making it a little bit tight on that end where it's going to, the frame's going to come up so it'll just tighten up to it. 
Right, so that's that's really it for that piece. We'll undo this and we'll take that off. So that's your your first piece made, which is going to sit in the bottom of the frame. So if you have a look at the old one here, that's where that's going to go. Now we can uh, rework this. We can put a few ridges on here mm -hmm. so that your feet will grip that, so it doesn't slip off. So there's lots of little additions we can do to that, but that's primarily the the piece of timber made. So the next thing is going to, I'm going to make the top and then the handle here for the, the fulcrum part. So um, it's really just making another one of those but the, the end pieces will be an inch, not inch and a quarter. What I'm going to do, you see from this other end we've just done off camera we've got a few ridges on here, well that will just act as a bit of a grip for our feet. And I'm going to do the same this end. Uh, every three quarters of an inch, create a mark. And bear in mind, we're going to have the uh, frame there, so we don't need to go any further past that. And I'm just going to come the opposite way. Oh, so that gives you like a groove. Yeah, so you're doing like a little V groove in, in there. It. Just take so it. Did you do it like that to get the fur off the, um, the furry bits? Yeah, it's just just cutting one side and the other. You see, I'm just altering the tool, literally from one side to the other. And it's just taking out the worst of it. And then what I'm going to do now, just pick up a few shavings. Uh, in my hand and then act like nature sandpaper. I'll just burnish that off, ruin any little furry bits. I'm just finishing off the surface. Okay, that's it. So moving on to the next piece, just very quickly, do you want to show how you actually adjust these? Yeah, well so you can see now that the, this next piece is a lot shorter. So what I have to do is adjust the poppets. And below there is some wedges that hold the poppets down to the bed. It's just a matter of tapping around the back, moving those out, and then adjusting up the poppet so that we can get this reasonably tight. We'll just undo that enough to make sure that we've got plenty of space. And then it's just a matter of knocking these in really tight to make sure that the poppets are down and locked solid. Okay. So just make sure we've got enough room there, brilliant. And then again with our uh, trusty pencil, I'm going to mark out the middle on both ends. getting the actual spur on the poppet on that pencil mark, line that in. I'm not going to go right home because what I want to do is pull the tool rest back and I just want to see how that runs on the lathe, which is great. So this is going to be the top piece um, on, this, on, on the frame. That's the bit that's going to actually clamp. This bit here. Yeah. I'm going to wind that right in now. Okay. And it's not quite tight. So I have to adjust that a little bit. So with the pole, there's a lot of adjusting, isn't there? That goes on. Yeah. Once, to... it, once it's once it's in place, it's okay. You've just got. This has to be quite rough on the top. Because over time, it, it, because of all the movement and whatever, it gets it does get smooth, so the poppets under pressure can move backwards. So, what's the next uh, step? You've got beeswax. Right. Y yeah, I've got some beeswax in my hand, but I've also got some um, uh, petroleum jelly as well, which you can use as a lubricant just to pop put on the ends. Although this is green, that's great. But if you're doing a lot of turning um, on one piece, eventually the moisture is removed out of the ends. Mm -hmm. of the uh, piece of timber it just because of the friction it really heats up 
and if you don't have any lubricant in there it squeals like mad <laughs> um, and ash is quite although this is quite freshly it, do, it is quite a dry timber so you can either use a little bit of beeswax shoved into it or um, petroleum jelly whatever's easiest for you to find I mean most pharmacies have this available well pretty well all of them so it's just a matter of putting a little bit on either end and that's that sorts that out now we've got that on I can actually add the string uh, we've got two turns I'll just show you a little bit about that because a lot of people get caught out by this so if you hold the string in your left hand imagine you're beating a, a string or a drum and you hit it and you turn it away from you and then another one you turn it away so that actually sets it up right for when you're using the treadle another thing that you've got to be aware of is also that you've got this tight because this is under quite a lot of pressure if you don't have the, the um, it locked in tightly what can happen is this will break out and this piece of timber can fly quite away like a catapult <laughs> yeah and I've, I've seen it happen at shows with other people they haven't got it done and bang it goes about 10 foot into the crowd and uh, that can be really dodgy so what we're going to do now is get set up and we're going to turn this now if you bear in mind we've got to go back to the uh, roughing gauge I'm just going to make sure that this is all running okay and we're away again and we're going to start turning just roughing out the high spots See how the, uh, as I'm pressing down the wood's coming towards me and I'm actually introducing the tool into it and as I lift my foot I'm pulling the tool away slightly so it doesn't rub the back of the tool because this is only carbon steel if you just held it there all the time see how I'm rubbing mm -hmm. I'll just rub a big gouge in the back and you don't want that again it's just a, a, another way of looking at your tool Okay, so this is the bottom of the frame where your feet are going to fit. This is going to be the top one. And we've got to make sure that the, the two fit exactly the same on the frame. So if we just, that's 12 inches, so I'm just going to mark the middle as 6 inches. And then either side of that, I'm going to need uh, 3 and an eighth. So that'll be 6 and a quarter there. And a three and an eighth there. Okay, so this, these two ends will be the the one inch tenons, which will sit through the frame and get fixed. And I'll just poke out a little bit. You can see that the two, three marks. Yeah. Centre, three eighths that side, three eighths that side, giving you six and a quarter, which will be the same as that piece on there. Okay, although this is a lot longer, bear in mind this is your feet sitting on here. Get this in lined up. I just want to get the so you're marking out the initial basically you you your um you're doing the initial markings basically. Yeah, to so get that sorted and I'm now gonna use the roughing gouge again to uh get this down a little bit towards an inch. So what I'm going to do now
You hear that squeaking? Yep. Means I need to get a, a bit more. A bit more of a lubricant on there. Now you don't necessarily have to take it off. Just get your finger in, dab it into there. Squeak's gone. There you go. So just checking that we, well, we we're way off an inch yet. So how are we looking now? Yeah, that's good. That's just nice and tight. That'll fit into the uh, one inch hole that we're going to drill with the bracing bit. And now basically just repeating the other side now? Yeah, we're going to do the other side, yeah. Yeah. Great. So we're looking good. So we've just simply repeated the same on the other side? Yeah. So there's been a bit of a fault there where I just caught it. And what happens, this is what happens with reciprocating lanes. If you don't control the tool, it runs away with you. You just can see the little bit of it which I've had to take off. Well, that's not going to affect what we do. That's just bad workmanship on my part. Okay, so that's the, uh, the top piece that we're going to use. So we've now got the top. So this is now the top part, the handle, yeah? Uh, this is a handle going in. This will be where everything full comes off this. Just going to get the bar just rubbing on the... Now what I'm doing, I'm just taking off the high spots. See there's still a flat there, see how it high spot there, taking all that side off and I've, we've got quite a bit to come off here yet. So we were just discussing something Neil, yep. um, so obviously this is going in like the middle section so this attaches it to the bench doesn't it? The yeah so this point. is your fulcrum, the, the handle will be um, made up this end, but this is the tenon that's going to go all the way through the body and frame. So just to kind of this is adjustable. So this is just a recap. This is this middle one here. Yeah, because it, it goes through. Uh, you were mentioning something. Obviously, we're working with green wood, so you were talking about the width of it. Yeah, the, the body is going to have a, an inch hole drilled through it, which is fine. But if you make the this an inch, the the, the handle, as the body starts to shrink and dry, it's going to bite tighten up and you don't want an inch um, a tenon going into an inch hole because it'll dry and shrink so when you take it home these need to be dried separately and if the uh, tenon hole um, sorry if the mortise hole shrinks up you can actually put an, another um, auger through it and just open it up again so the point being is that everything's going to dry so if yep. i leave this inside the actual mortise yeah uh, there's a it's chance it could, just, it could just seize up basically indeed so this needs to be slightly smaller anyway and i'm going to make this around about seven eighths of an inch as compared to the mortise hole which is going to be an inch so it's it it, it rattles through and it'll be nice and smooth at the end of the day it'll hold and uh, um, and, and create a good ful fulcrum so what we're going to do now is just turn it round and then do the other end. So obviously that's going to be gripped by your hand. As long as that's bigger and thicker than the, the actual tenon, it, that's okay. But I don't want any, particularly any, well there's a little bit of a flap which you can take off with the chisel, but that, that'll be the size of the handle. You can see there's the mark that I've still got, which I'm still going to just put a reference point in there. Okay, all this will come off, but I just want to make sure that I've got enough for the handle and then I can... So, I'm just going to try and take out as I can that with a... Finish that with the 
rough engage. Now I'm going to try and just get the ten in the same width, which is about seven eighths of an inch. See how I'm coming up there, it's all starting to fur and chatter, so I'll just cut that down a little bit more. Okay, and I'm just going to put it So you're making quite a rounded, aren't you? Yeah, it's just really so nice. It's just really so we've got something to grab hold of. It's not just going to be a... Uh, Just roughed out like that. Use a bit of the old nature sandpaper again and we'll just burnish that up. Now let's just put a bit of a shine on it. See on the edges it's just catching it. But well, that's removed all those little burrs. So the last piece we're doing is the peg that's going to go in the board and we're just doing one peg to go in. Okay, so now we've got that set up. Again, what I'm going to do is just round it off um, before I put the round finial on the top. fading it's just catching the uh... right it's okay so what I've got to do now is just remove all that that's just be a little knock on the end of that
The socket gouge you use in a very small Yeah, it's called gouge. a spindle gouge. It's basically going to be so you can get your finger in there and uh, got something to grab hold of when you pull it out. Okay. And then we're just going to put another This is going to be an inch all the way down this spindle. I just want to make sure we a little bit. I just want to get make sure we get it right at this end, and then I can do follow the rest through. So what I'm going to do is stop there now, and I'm going to turn it round. And just follow it an inch longer across the whole. Yeah, across the whole thing. Now I've got a nice surface to turn on there. That should run a little bit better. Okay. There we go. There's your, your knob which you'll grab hold of. Something tight. That's waggling there. Coming up to tight. So you've done it taper right at the bottom so it's just Yeah, easy to get so in. it'll slide in and then you can tap it home. Perfect. Uh, I think actually it might just need a little bit off there. I'm just gonna do that. The, as I say, I think the the poppets are a little bit out on this old lathe. Uh, something else we're going to have to look at here. And it's just going to be locked solid at the end. Of it. That's it. So that's all four bits done. And then this is going to be burnished with the shaving. Yeah, we can do that as well. The nature sandpaper just to finish off. See that, that actual uh, spindle there is quite hot. Move that across, get the string over there, do it down here. Just smooth it off. So Neil, I just wanted to touch on a uh, option of doing the uh, the tenons yep. uh, for those that don't have a pole lathe. So, um, what is the kind of other alternative they can do? Well, you could uh, get the billet down to the sim to, to almost the right size, and then I, what I've set up here is a brace and bit, and it, the brace is really just to mark the end of your billet. You haven't got to do much more than that. Okay, and that gives you a rough mark for an inch. Mm -hmm. So then what I can do is I can then draw knife this down quite happily to that mark. Yeah. To that mark. And that will give you your tenon. Bear in mind you've got to have a thick bit up here so you may want to put a saw cut or a mark, pencil mark around it and you'll just work it down parallel to that mark. Okay, like I said before, do the square cuts. And just tell I'm just down to the right size because that little bit's come out. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So you know you're there. Turn it. Just there on that bit. Turn it. Mm 
and we're just there. So now we've got four sides which are just, well, that, one more side, I've just got to bring that down a little bit further. There we are. So the four points, north, uh, north, south, east, west, or if you want to call it 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, mm. 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, whatever, um, that's fine. And then we're going to turn it on its edge and we're just going to bring down the corners similarly. And that, that end, yeah. This is where you've got to start being a little bit careful with what you take off. So you're almost down and then you can be really gentle about. Now that's not going to be far off a perfect circle as long as you take the ridges off. And you can see what, what I've done is I'm just down to that cut where there's some furry bits that's got to come off. That's not bad for a tenon is it? Now there is another way of doing that as well which I'll show you with another tool. Perfect, let's have a look. What I've got set up here is a Veritas tenon cutter made by Lee Valley Tools. Um, there is also an adapter you can get which fits into the end of the brace. So a bit like the brace bit, you see they both fit the same tool. So this is quite a good setup for someone who wants to just start out um, making uh, tenons, you know, sort of post and wrong stools and things like that. So what I can do here, although I'm just sat on the shave horse doing this, ideally it would be on a bench, but you can see I'm just getting it in, making sure that the, the body of the tenon cutter, the adapter and the body of the brace are all in the line with the timber that you've got. So that's that way. There is a little um, uh, thing here that's going to give you a level but I wouldn't even look at that. I obviously wouldn't put those on because they're a little bit awkward really. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, I'm looking down here so it's dead in line. Also you need to be aware of the up and down position as well. You see that? So it's not only left and right but up and down and you've got to get that essentially on there. And what I'm doing is I'm pressing down and drilling as we go. Really you could be doing this stood up. So you get these shavings and you get a tenon. So you have a look at the, the tenon I did with the one end. It's got some facets on. This one has still got a, a, a roughish edge to it depending on how good you are with the tool. But it's a little bit rounder. So, but they both work adequately. So Neil, the four components are done then? Yeah, so basically we've got the uh, foot um, part of the frame made. There's the handle that's going to be the fulcrum that the frame will twist on and then we've got the at the upper part which is going to be the clamping mechanism at the top end of the frame and the fourth part that we turned was the basically the pin that's going to keep the um, the ramp or the plank um, that we're going to be clamping to and that just keeps that in position. So to surmise, obviously you've shown all this on the pole but as you just demonstrated there are other techniques of doing yeah, it basically. Yeah, you could have used rounder planes on it. Um, there are um, um, all sorts of stale engines and rounder planes that will uh, do these one inch tenon cutters and um, tenons I should say and you can get them at different shapes. This one's one and a quarter, there are others at, uh, of a different sizes so it's well worth investing. If you can get a pole lathe great but there are other means of uh, working. Perfect. So Neil, now we're onto the side arms. Now the first thing you want to do is you're, you said you want to trim them off to so, uh, size, basically. Yeah, we're going to keep it at around 37 and a half inches for this particular height because we've got a good long leg on this, and we want to make it long enough for you and your friends to be able to use. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot taller people than you, and maybe there'll be some. That's it. I've, I've actually some friends now. That's it. To yeah. Use it. So it, it'll be. Um, interchangeable for different heights of people. So we'll keep it around about 37 and a half, but we're going to trim off this dead knot here. So 
So Neil, just before obviously we draw the holes yep. into the side arms, uh, so obviously we're just looking at the, the measurements, how far we're going to you know, place the holes and whatnot. So you just want to talk through what we've decided on this particular lathe. Well, with this one, because we know the whole length of the arm is around about 37 inches, mm. um, we're going to allow a good inch and a half below the bottom of the hole. So between the bottom hole and the bottom of there, we're going to allow a good inch and a half so it doesn't break out. Then we're going to do an inch and a quarter hole. Then between there and uh, the first hole, we're going to do 20 inches. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that will be the first hole for the fulcrum. And then we're going to do incrementally in a two inch spaces, three holes. And they're an inch. Uh, and that's an inch tenon. Okay, and then between the middle hole and the top one, we're going to do a nine inch gap. And that should be uh, adjustable enough for what your needs are. And just to kind of like, for those of you a bit pedantic, we're going to do two holes on the bottom with the foot, but we've yeah. just decided right now we're going to do just the one. Yeah, just the one. I mean, you can always add that in at a later date. Yeah. Um, to suit your uh, your needs. But all these adjustments are adjustable for most people. You know, you can add it, shrink it, bigger, whatever, to suit yourself. Right. So Neil, you just realised you want to do quite a, one quicker amendment to yeah, the top to clamp. Yes, to the very top bit, and what we're going to do is we're going to put just a little flat on it. You can put a V-shaped uh, in it as well to clamp the timber, but it's just really, we're just going to put a, don't worry about that too much, we'll have to just amend that off. And so what's the reasoning behind this? Um, it actually clamps the timber a little bit better, so the just flat a round bit. edge, just a flat edge. You can see, if you have a look, you've got a, a nice flat edge now, rather than a, um, a rounded edge. So that'll actually sit and gra grasp a little bit more. What you can also do is we'll put a little V cut into there, so that will sit on a, a round tenon and grab it a little bit more as well. Cool. So if you've got a larger, flatter piece, like a spatula or something, that will grab it on the flat. Mm -hmm. If you've got a little round end or a, a a tenon that you're you're trying to and that will grab that as well so it's just these little additions which is going to make your shave horse a lot safer and easier to use cool shall we add that on then yeah so um, I just need to mark that up centrally that'd be about there all right okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand up and I'm going to cut this So you're literally just sawing a V into Yeah, that's all it is. Let's just get that a bit of crap. Yeah, just a V in there as well. And that will sit and grab hold of any round tenon like that. Okay. So Neil, we've marked off the hole. So this is the bottom one for the... This is going to be the inch and a quarter. Mm -hmm. That's for the, um, the, the foot um, part of the, the frame, treadle. Then we've got three holes, and these are set at now two and a half inches, not the two inches that we discussed. I think in the, uh, appropriately, uh, that older one um, was made for um, children particularly. And I think we need to just up these a little bit. So these are two and a half inches between, uh, you can see the original markings and we've mm -hmm. opened them up a bit. And then between the middle and the, that one is nine inches, but I've also added a second hole just in case we uh, need to use that as well. It's fine. It just gives you loads of options then in so, terms of... Uh, so what you said is we're, we're going to do a dry fit yeah. with one hole and then, and then, then just kind of uh, uh, adjust and, it. And there. adjust it to, to suit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I've got the two drills set up here. So we've got the inch and a quarter and the inch. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do the, 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 the uh, bottom one first, which is the inch and a quarter. So I'm going to, I've clamped it together and we're just going to go straight through the lot. Okay, so we've got a, 
and I'm just eyeing this in. This drill needs to be vertical to the top of the timber. Okay, so it's not over there or not over there. It's not that way or that way. It's got to be dead vertical as best as you can get it. Um, I can just get that in and we can use a level, sorry, a square to, to give us a rough idea if that's the right place and that's pretty good. Not bad for uh, lining it out, is it? So that's level. So in future I should just have you in my tool bag when I'm checking stuff. <laughs> I'll just pull you up when I need you. <laughs> so eventually you do get used to. Now the inch and a quarter bit is quite a tough bit to overcome. And this is into green timber, bear in mind. One thing you've got to be really careful with your the brace bits is making sure that everything is sharp. So Neil, the holes are done, but you haven't gone all the way through. No, so what we're going to do is we've um, we've as drilled so far and the pin or the the screw thread at the end of the uh, auger has just popped through. So we'll turn this over now, keeping both together, and we can just see a little bit where the holes have gone. One, two, and there's another one somewhere just about there, and then the other one finally there. So we haven't got to have that one in the way. We've got that already there, you can see they're partly done. So what I'm going to do is just clamp that on now. Okay, so got one there, one there, one there, so you can just about see the holes poking through. So I'm going to start with the one and a quarter down this end. So in short, this is in order to prevent the breakthrough. Just yeah. stopping breakthrough, so you get a nice clean hole either side. Just a minute. There we go, all the way through. And that's it, so you've got a perfect hole. Yeah, so we're now, that's the one and a quarter done. So Neil, obviously the holes are done in the side, but there's some. You wanted to do one quick little tweak, didn't you? Yeah, this, it, this is just a, an addition. It doesn't make the tool any better, but it, it's just something that um, some turners do on their their wood turning, it, and it's a bit of fun to see uh, how man makes fire. Now uh, we're just using a, a steel wire on here, and you can see from the smoke coming off, it just burns in. Do another one. Lovely smell. And it just create, creates an addition to uh, whatever you're turning. On chair legs, uh, this is done a lot as well, just to uh, show off <laughs> the leg structure. Um, on things like a, um, uh, some garden implements, dibbers and things like that, the, the one inch increments are, are usually uh, denoted with a line like this. And the other thing is, is it, it burns all those little fibres that are maybe sticking up inside of that anyway. So you're getting rid of them. So there we are. So Neil, we're going to do a dry run, aren't we? To make sure everything fits. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with the, 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 the foot part of it. Uh, that fits okay. I'm going to fit the top bit in. And then uh, try and get the two together. Looking good. Okay, and then obviously this fits at the whatever height you want the treble to go. Okay, and this all fulcrum on here. So now we can, when we've drilled the hole, we can do a bit of a, a fit to the uh, to the actual 
shave horse. Perfect. So on the body now we're going to go drill the holes, yeah? Yeah, we are indeed. We'll do that next. Perfect. So Neil, you're just marking off the holes. Uh, now I, I actually sat down on this uh, off camera, so you could do this properly, but obviously yeah. you're sitting on here. Um, just to illustrate how you measured up where the holes are going to go. Yeah, so you sat on the, uh, the saddle part, and the first hole is normally um, six inches or 150 millimeters from the front of your knee to the first hole center. And then we're gonna do increments of two and a half. So you may put three holes in this. And just one important thing, when we sat down, you told me to basically put my, 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 yeah, you've got to my sit posterior right, in, right up to the right edge. Right into the edge. I've actually gone a bit further because we've designed this for you, this particular one. Um, and each one's made specifically for individual use but we're, we're also trying to make it for a generic use most people are of a similar height but that's the measurement that we'll be using is about six inches from the front of the knee to the first hole and and what we're going to do now is from the top we're going to mark down a square either side from the top base and normally what I do is we try and get the hole quite close to the top here so the center is probably going to be about an inch down so that'll leave you about half an inch of timber so this is going to be an inch hole remember going through mm -hmm. now we've got to be really careful with the drilling that it doesn't come up at an angle or mm -hmm. go down at an angle it's got to be parallel to this surface on the top mm -hmm. so everything claps on that so this is where using squares and sights lines and somebody else helping you if you can to do right. that it's quite important perfect I've got Kieran helping me with this particular section because um, you're on the camera so it's <laughs> no. a bit difficult to help but thank you Kieran for helping out. Basically what's happening is we've got that line that we uh, marked on it uh, which is square to the top and what I'm going to do now is I want to drill a parallel uh, mortise using the uh, bracing bit going straight the way through. I'm using the, the line of this um, steel rule so I'll get a parallel uh, measurement here and I'm also looking down that line as well and I'll keep the the brace uh, the auger in line with that so let's just start that off get that in place once I've got it locked I just want to check I've got it reasonably parallel and then I'm going to go through and this is where you got to have courage of your convictions have a little check, yeah. So he's just poked through, it's difficult to see on the camera. But you can just see the, the pin just there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to withdraw that out now bringing us what swarf we've got left in there, the chips. And I'm going to come around the other side. And this is one skin to prevent the, the breakout. Just that breakout, yeah. You can see that was quite an accurate uh, drill. You know, really well though, actually. And what's the reason that you wouldn't just go straight through? Because uh, it would just break out the fibres. Oh, I see. So that's all it is. And there we are, following the hole back through the other way. Just and pushing out any fibres we've got there. Then we just do the same the other one. Yep. We can uh, now on this side. We can uh, set up. So the second one, after oh, going through a knot, we've got through. And once again, it's difficult to see on camera, but that's just poking through now. All right. So I'm just going to withdraw that. Bring all the swarf with me. And we'll come round this side. It's just off the line. There we go. And it's actually just Okay, that can be done with a, um, as I say, this is a um, Jennings pattern. Mm. 
bracing bit. It could also be done with a Scotch eye auger if you've got slightly wider bit. And bear in mind we've got this is six inches and you've probably got about eight inches worth of cutter mm -hmm. to play with. So just about get that through. Perfect. So we're just doing a test run. Obviously the pin's got to go down the bottom and this is probably a good example of uh, so sort of taking my shoes off, but you can see I can then whoop, you can just put your hand on the bottom of there, Kieran, just to hold it. Okay, and I can just use that as a clamp, but that works adequately. Okay, and just by adjusting the that forward and back, you can you've got some adjustment there, but you've also got adjustment in the hole, so you can get some quite big bits of timber in here. Yeah. Um, bear in mind if it's a you know you won't want to be holding great big lumps, but somewhere between three and four inches would be adequate so yeah, that's just me holding that but there we are and that's without any pins holding it together that's just holding it like so so the next thing and final thing is we're just going to drill the uh, pin that holds the plank and you can see what I was saying about the pivoting point yeah yeah it lifts it up it lifts it? it up so that pin that we've got to hold it down mm -hmm. it's got to be drilled at an angle and that that means that that doesn't happen so Neil we've clamped this on yep the board so are you looking obviously at the angle and yeah so what what's going to happen now is uh, I've got to put this pin in now if I was to use this as the my datum uh, point here as a, a level, I can see I've got it at right angles now to the board. Well, if I was to use that, what's likely to happen is you press down on there, this is likely to fire up. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to put this in at a bit of an angle. Okay. Like so. Okay. And what that does is it actually, when you press on there, it locks in position, it can't come out. So I'm just going to drill, you can see where the leg runs up. I'm just going to drill the other side of that at an angle. Now, there's no specific angle, just make sure it's oh, more over than of the 90 degrees from this here. So it's probably adding, like if you took a measurement, it's probably about 110 degrees from the uh, from vertical, from the base, I should say. Okay, so we're through. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to get myself into a position where I'm drilling a hole like so. Now I'm going to get to a point where I can't go any further. So I've already got the hole set. Mm -hmm. I can take that off and draw that out. Undo that. Take the plank off. Now we've just got the hole started, and all been well. I'll just keep going. And with this, do you go all the way through? Or? Yeah, all the way through. Okay, so the last and final piece, we're going to um, push the plank back through and line up the holes for the peg. And we'll just give a gentle tap down. And that's it. So that's locked. Now we'll just have a check. See, I'm really pushing hard on that plank doesn't doesn't pull up look at a fantastic what a difference that's made huh yeah and that's why that angle is really important you've got to get that if you start drilling at 90 degrees it's likely to pop up um, and there we are that's really the shave horse made the only things are what we're going to do now 
is we're going to ensure that this top piece is pegged nice and tight and so is the feet down below. The handle obviously remains loose so we can move it about. But that really is about it. Final touches we could round the ends off of the ears mm -hmm. on the uh, top and bottom and that just creates so you don't catch your hand on any sharp edges. But that's really the, the shave horse made. So guys, uh, we've had to move into this amazing barn just across from the workshop, but it is getting absolutely pitch black outside. <laughs> so it's impossible to film. This is an incredible barn. Um, like I said, we'll do a detailed video of this location at a later date. Um, so we're just on the last legs now, and on the, we're looking at some pegs. And uh, here you go, Mr. Mapes is uh, carving out some oak pegs, is that correct? Yeah, there's a bit of English oak, um, air dried and then it's been brought inside so it's probably well dry which is what we need really for this I'm just going to um, attempt to make some pegs that are going to fit through the hole in the, and yeah as I say that's just coming up quite nicely and speaking of inside my apologies about the lighting it's indoor lighting so it comes out very very different to the outside lighting but we have to make do so you've done a sample piece here to obviously test out the hole as you're carving it. Yeah, so it, it, as I say, you, you drill the hole the size that you want and we're just creating the pegs out of a bit of square, squared uh, air dried timber and that really fits in nice and tight. And then this will go through into here and just peg in. It doesn't need to go all the way through. Um, idea if you had a peg that went all the way through you can tap it back out and that's the problem it becomes loose but mm -hmm. if you drive it in it, 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 <laughs> it's only one way it can't be tapped out again you just have to twist it and pull it out um, so there is a, um, a, a, a function for not drilling all the way through okay Essentially, just holds the peg in place, then. Yeah, it? and you can twist and pull those out and adjust. And we'll get so there you go, guys. That is a wrap for this very comprehensive and long tutorial on how to make a Bodger's shave horse. Neil, I cannot thank you enough. Clean a bit, it's been a pleasure. Oh, no, we're really pleasure. tight, we're really tight. Now, you wouldn't believe it watching this video, but this has been recorded over a period of three days. So that's how much we've had to condense into this tutorial. Uh, coinciding with this, we've, uh, we've been building two shave horses. So one I've been building for the base camp, which will be shown at a later date. So that's why it's taken an incredible amount of work. Now, as we said in the beginning of this video, this video is designed to teach you how to make the specifically the bodger uh, pattern uh, of shave horse. There are many styles that are out there. There's many ways of doing it. You see the combination in this video of using machine tools, various hand tools, etc. The goal is, is that you really kind of use what you've got to hand. Now obviously when you have the right equipment, it makes certain jobs a hell of a lot easier. But the idea of this video was to take Neil's vast experience and condense it down to show you little mini masterclasses throughout, for example, the pole lathe and uh, draw, uh, using a draw knife, etc, etc. So I hope you got some value. Uh, some degree from this video. More importantly, I hope you've got some inspiration to go maybe attempt yourself uh, to just, you know some kind of shave horse yourself. Because I know a shave horse is a really useful uh, piece of equipment. I think you'd agree. Oh, you couldn't uh, really work green without it. It's, it. it's one of the backbones of the uh, the job, really. Yeah. yeah. So it's just one of those things. I feel, I feel quite chuffed now. Now thanks to this guy over here, <laughs> uh, I've got an amazing one built with it. You know, uh, uh, built under his uh, kind of supervision, his tuition, and many many years of experience. So I'm really chuffed. Like I said, the one that I built for myself, uh, you will be seeing at a later date, and we're actually sitting on it here and now. Now a couple of things to kind of quickly add. This was obviously used primarily using green wood. Uh, so what Neil has suggested that we actually take it apart uh, with the green wood because obviously that's going to shrink, is that correct? It uh, will, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, everything will fit back together again. The, the legs and everything are tenoned with tapers on, so it'll all fit back together. Shouldn't be a problem. Um, and again, all the uh, the frame and everything is good to go. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. When I get it home, I'm going to leave it to air dry outside, covered up uh, for about a month, two months, and then obviously we're good to go. Uh, and then making sure everything kind of slots together, and then that's it. Happy days, man. Using yeah. my shape horse with pride. Uh, uh, just to reiterate that you could use um, pl uh, planked lumber as well. Um, it, uh, but of course the seat that we've got is a nice saddle on it so it'd be a yeah. little bit difficult to make it yeah. to it. And, and this is the key thing here, obviously we, we've done things in a very kind of, uh, uh, I say kind of traditional way, like using green wood etc. But just use whatever you've got to hand, if it's off the shelf from your DIY store, yeah, even if it's nails or whatever, there's no right and wrong here. This is a key thing that we need to get across. Just because Neil has done it in a particular way doesn't mean that's the only way. Yeah. Right? You know, just it's do exactly whatever right. just do whatever you deem fit. We've just shown you certain techniques, and this is just one out of hundreds yeah. of It's thousands. my way. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's your way. So there you go. Once again, hope you enjoyed this video. We know it's a long video. As I stressed at the beginning, uh, we have a breakdown below in the description with a time on all the different sections should you sh uh, so wish to jump that particular segment of the video. Now, a couple of things just to wrap up. Uh, firstly, without a shadow of a doubt, and it's needless to say, I'm gonna put a link to Neil Mate's social media, his Instagram and his Facebook, both of whom, of which he's very prolific, and it will mean the world to me, just as a way of saying thank you. You've gotta remember, this guy's taken three days out of his working life. You know, he's a working man, does this for a living and he's, he's shown me hospitality, um, and it's taken three days to, to allow me to also document a process that he's taken many, many years to refine. Not a lot of people would be willing to do that, and so it would mean the world to me if you got any form of benefit from this video, to so go and check out uh, Neil Maps on uh, Instagram and Facebook, links below in the description, and give him a follow. I'm also gonna put a link to the Smallwood Center, who have very kindly given us permission to use their facilities here, and it's an incredible location, it really is. So it mean the world to me, I'll put a link to those guys below as well. Feel free to go and check those guys out. Also, like I mentioned, I will be hopefully, at a later date, coming back to the center to spend more time and show you a lot more detail, the facilities, the setup they got here, this incredible barn that we're in, and all the work that they're doing uh, to help small wood owners, woodland owners, uh, manage and learn about forestry, woodwork, etc. etc. So please do go check out Neil, please do go check out the links to the Smallwood Centre, and uh, all the links will be in the description below. And I've also posted a lot of stuff up on Instagram, just search for Z Outdoors and you'll see me on there posting some behind the scenes stuff. So there you go, that is a wrap for this video. I sincerely appreciate you watching all the way through. If you've lasted up until now, Neil, thank you once again. Brilliant, thank you. you know, a heartfelt thank you to this guy for taking time out over the three days. And as always, I hope whatever you do from Neil and myself, this is Zed from Zed Outdoors. Peace out. Goodbye.